Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, thanks for being here and welcome back. Um, for anyone who wasn't here yesterday, I just want to, by way of introduction, um, sort of get us back on the same plane and um, talk about what we're all doing here together, talking about the arts and crafts. We have two main ways of entering this subject uh, over these last two days. One is tracing explicit connections with arts and crafts and William Morris, and the ways that different followers selectively appropriated his ideas and his figure. Another way that we've been considering the arts and crafts is not the arts and crafts specifically or con connections to William Morris himself, um, but the related responses to industrialization, capitalism, and colonialism happening in the early the mid 19th and early 20th century and uh, shared concerns with labor, aesthetics, and politics. So there are many craft revival uh, practices and movements happening around the world at this point uh, in time that do not claim any specific connection to William Morris. And indeed, as some of the papers yesterday explored, there may even be a tension between some of the explicit arts and crafts organizations and other related handcraft movements um, such as the home arts industries or uh, indigenous groups seeking to advance their own um, craft revival schemes for cultural or economic purposes. Um, so we're really looking at a number of different but intersecting and shared concerns here. Um, I raised the point yesterday that we can think of some of William Morris's ideals as guiding principles or things to think with rather than specifically um, dogma that each of these uh, movements adopted. Um, and this allows us to think more widely about craft revival, both in the historic moment, but also in the present day. So some of these ideals include the dignity of labor, the equality of the arts, a joy to maker and user, joy in labor, the earthly paradise, the art of the people, the past is not dead, beautiful or useful, and the beauty of life. I briefly mentioned yesterday that this might also help us think about uh, legacies to today. So not just legacies around the world in the historical moment, but legacies today as well. Um, and I think that even though many, most of these movements have no mention of William Morris whatsoever, they share something of his concerns um, organizations such as the Nest Artisan Guild, which is in the bottom right, uh, point out that handcraft industries are still major sources of economic and cultural power in many countries, and especially for women. Documentaries such as The True Cost or um, movements such as uh, uh, Fashion Revolution, among others across art and design, are part of rising calls to rethink issues in production, labor, climate and the preservation of craft and tradition and knowledge in the context of global inequality and climate change. Um, of course, there's also programs like Marie Kondo, um, and I think her catchphrase of spark joy really is essentially uh, William Morris's, do not have anything in your homes that you do not believe to be beautiful or know to be useful. Um, but her program is much more uh, minimal than some other appropriations of William Morris. And this is just some indication of some of the contemporary artists who have been inspired by and reworked some of Morris's themes. Artists such as Kahinda Wiley um, and Sonia Boyce have used Morris's designs and ideals to comment on perceptions of excess and ornamentation in relation to Black and non-Western art, and also to make claims on behalf of undervalued communities and aesthetics. Um, and I particularly like that in Kahinda Wiley's um, shop font, he's got this sort of Morrissey and Um And these are very contrasting visions. And I think this came out a little bit in some of the talks yesterday as well, that there's a lot of nuance in arts and crafts and a lot of complexities and difference and a lot of tensions. One of these being the tension between simplicity and splendor. Simplicity in Marie Kondo or for instance, Mingay or splendor and excess and um, the ornamentation that was so, is so important and attractive to these artists. Um, and in fact, this was something that arts and crafts 
uh, workers commented on at the time, Walter Crane actually wrote that the great advantage uh, and charm of the Mercian method is that it lends itself either to simplicity or to splendor. So it's already a duality and a tension there. Um, we also explored some other tensions between uh, the crediting of artists and craftsmen, um, between the desire for an anonymous maker, an anonymous sort of cultural movement, but also the felt and perceived need for the intervention um, and intercession of designer craftsmen, uh, especially in the context of colonialism. And moreover, we explored how arts and crafts and control over the crafts was used as an instrument of power um, in ways to control and improve the crafts and by extension to control communities and peoples. So today we have three sessions, um, two in the morning, one in the afternoon, um, exploring some of these ideas in relation to labor and materials, the Middle East, and political claims. Uh, as a reminder of our format, what we'll do is we'll have each of these sessions here in this room, uh, featuring either two or three papers, and at the end of the day at four o'clock, we'll retire to the seminar room to have a fuller discussion where we will be joined um, with a, by a respondent via Zoom. The first panel today uh, is called The Earthly Paradise, which takes its name from an epic poem by William Morris. Um, and this session is particularly concerned with the issue of narration. How do we narrate and imagine labor and materials um, and what affordances and properties that they uh, convey symbolically? Our two panelists this morning are joining us by Zoom, um, and I will facilitate a discussion with the panelists on Zoom and us here in the room afterwards. So with that, I'd like to introduce our first uh, speaker, um, and we'll play his video, uh, and then he'll join us afterwards for live Q&A, Siddharth Pandey. Siddharth Pandey is a global fellow in humanities, oops, is a, global fellow, is a fellow in global humanities at the Kata Hamburger Center for Advanced Studies, Global Disconnect, LMU, Munich. He has previously held fellowships in literature and travel cultures, global history and art history at the Yale Center for British Art, LMU's Center for Global History, and London's Paul Mellon Center for Studies in British Art. He has a PhD in English and Materiality Studies from the University of Cambridge, and his research interests span literature, history, cultural studies, and the visual arts. His first book, Fossil, 2021, was shortlisted for the 2022 Banff Mountain Fiction and Poetry Prize. Um, welcome, Siddharth, and we can queue up the video. A very good morning to all of you. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, but thank you for allowing me to uh, attend this uh, symposium remotely. Special thanks to uh, Antonia and her great team as well for organizing this very important uh, this very important symposium around a topic which is very close to my heart actually, not only as an academic but also as a practitioner. So without further ado, I'll, get, uh, I'll uh, get straight into the heart of the matter. My talk is titled, Of Making Makers and Magic, The Politics of Skillful Doing in Narratives of Enchantment. And the basic argument that I'm taking here is to think about the legacies and reach of the arts and crafts movement in the context of fantasy literature, which is by far the most popular genre of writing currently and has been so for a while now, at least in the English language internationally. And to, to place that legacy within the ethical, imaginative, and community-based iterations of the head-hand connection around which wonder and enchantment generates. And this is a connection um, or, uh, that, that was constantly you know, iterated, as we all know, by, um, by, by the likes of Ruskin and Morris and other figures of the arts and crafts movement as well, which basically then dissolves the, uh, the distinctions between uh, mental labor and manual labor or the head and the hand, basically the Cartesian duality, right? And what I'm arguing is that the, the the various iterations of this kind of a connection and also it's it's placing within the larger set of community of craftspeople is what generates uh, wonder or enchantment or is one of the reasons or factors for the generation of wonder or enchantment in, in fantasy uh, literature and, and cinema as well. 
And now I'm not the first person to make this connection between the arts and crafts movement and uh, and fantasy literature. Uh, people like Farrah Mendelssohn and Edward James and many other fantasy critics have already done so. The quote here reads like the movement that contributed most to the look and feel of this of the kind of fantasy that would dominate in the bookshops in later 20th century was the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, wholly encompassed by William Morris, the creator of full fantasy, the first creator. Morris's principal fantasy heritage is an indefinitely extensible quest in which landscape itself plays a major part. His other contribution was to create a pseudo-medieval diction for his characters. So while these three aspects of pseudo-medievality or quest and landscape have been repeatedly noticed, what um, I feel is that 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 the element of um, craftsmanship in itself hasn't been commented on that extensively and that's what is going to uh, form the major focus of, of this presentation as well. But before I go on into the examples and illustrations, I wanted to throw this couple of uh, quotations in the beginning and also flag uh, uh, the fact that in the last one to two decades, there has been a flurry of books basically written on the topic of hands and hand handmaking and craftsmanship and the philosophy of, you know, embodied doing, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, all in kind of taking forward the, for the tradition of, of Ruskinian and Morrison thought. Um, and two of my favorite thinkers are Richard Sennett and Tim Ingold. I think Sennett teaches philosophy, um, sociology and probably philosophy as well at, at, at uh, NYU and Tim Ingold is a British uh, anthropologist, but also a number of other people as well have been writing in, in this kind of a tradition and philosophizing um, uh, and theorizing on, on what haptics mean and what doing things by hand means. So here are four, so four quotes to consider. First one is by William Morris, the brain that guides the hand must be healthy and hopeful, must be keenly alive to the surroundings of our own days. And the reverse is also true, that if the brain makes a good hand and the good hand also leads to um, a well-being, uh, uh, the, the well-being of society, not only of person, but of society at large. Um, and the second and third quote are from uh, Senate, which uh, talk about craftsmanship. And Senate defines craftsmanship as, as naming an enduring basic human impulse, a desire to do a job well for its own sake. Something again that we'll see getting illustrated in a couple of examples that I'll be taking. He also says that joint skill and community is an ancient ideal of craftsmanship. And it's interesting that many times when fantasy tries to depict this culture of craftsmanship, it is not only one person, but somehow that person is either connected to a legacy of many other people or to a community of people. So that sense of joint skill also gets demonstrated again and again um, in, in, in fantasy universes. But what is skill? And this is where Ingol comes in. Ingol defines skill as something that is also ecological in nature and which basically refers to the capabilities of action and perception of the whole organic being situated in a richly structured environment. And therefore skills are both biological as, and as well as cultural in nature. And it's interesting that he uses the word richly structured environment because part of the reason why we read fantasy novels or watch fantasy cinema is also to see the world building, right? The richly structured world building, which I'm arguing is heavily influenced by uh, a, a, a strong material consciousness rooted in craftsmanship. So to take a couple of examples, the first one is from the Roots of Mountains, widely considered to be the first sort of novel fantasy, fantasy novel form. Of course, the, the, the idea of right, the, the sense of fantasy or the modality of fantasy goes back to thousands of years, right, from the first Western epics. But in the modern novel form, especially in the English language, mm -hmm. this is the novel that is credited to be the first. Um, first uh, fantasy novel, which also hugely influenced Tolkien. Now, The Roots of Mountains, 1889, is a book that is like many other books is set in uh, I mean depicts a particular utopia set in a fictional place called Bergdale where people live healthy happy loving lives as it were and um, on the other hand is the enemy camp camp uh, so the quote that I'm taking here is the, a description of that enemy camp and it's interesting to see how the, the arts and crafts ethos gets kind of echoed um, in the negation of craftsmanship that this quote is referring to um, and this is speaking about the enemies they had no mind to till the teeming earth or to sit at the loom hammered in the smithy wretched and befouled was their well-builded house the hangings rent away away the goodly painted walls 
rooms topped and smeared with wicked tokens of alien murderers, the floor once bright with polished stones of the mountain was now as foul as the den of the man devouring troll of the heats. Yeah? So it's interesting that the evilness or the villainy of the enemies doesn't only really derive because they rape or murder people, but also because that they can't make things, that they can't that they don't do things well, right? Literally doing things in an embodied fashion. And this is an idea that then gets taken uh, up by by Tolkien in literally all of his work, but most importantly and most famously, I would think in in The Hobbit, his children's text, nineteen thirty seven, where um, the dragon is the evil person, right, and who has stolen the wealth and the jewels of of the dwarf community. And here is one dwarf explaining um, uh, explaining this this villainy it said that dragons steal gold and jewels; they never enjoy. Again, that, that sense of enjoyment is very crucial to the arts and crafts ethos. They never enjoy a brass ring of it. They hardly know a good bit of work from a bad one, <laughs> though they really have a good notion of the current market value. Well, again, the critique of capitalism. And they can't make a thing for them. So then this, this notion of not being able to make a thing is, again, the heart of um, of villainy, as it were. Now, um, a counter example, which basically celebrates craftsmanship, I have taken from the magician's nephew, um, the, uh, the 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 prequel to the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, um, written by uh, C.S. Lewis, wherein when um, as wherein when the the whole world, the fantastical world of Narnia, gets created, Aslan, the Lion King, basically summons the dwarves and orders them to make. And this is a very celebratory, a celebratory sort of a environment that takes place there right and he says um show your smith craft ordered the lion king fire started blazing and the bellows were roaring and the gold was melting and hammers were clinking how those dwarves loved their work again that sense of love and um which and, and pleasure which is very central to to morris's thought at least under the clever fingers of the little smiths, two crowns took shape, not ugly, heavy things like modern European crowns, but light, delicate, beautifully shaped circles that you could really look nicer by wearing. Yeah, going back to the uh, medievalist aesthetic, as it were. Uh, I want to take two examples in some detail. And I mean, these examples actually go in, I mean, in numerous numbers, as, as it were. You could, there's a whole tradition of people, uh, fantasists, and I'm here focusing only on the British fantasy. Um, you know, uh, legacy as it were. There are people from Alan Garner to Susan Cooper to many other people. They are constantly involved with the depiction um, of of maker figures in some some way or the other. Here I am just closing uh, this particular discussion with two examples. The first one is William Horwood, a very popular. British fantasy uh, and children's children's writer, and this is his most recent fantasy quartet, the Hidden World series, which. It's set in contemporary Britain and revolves around a hidden community community of people, folk known as hidden, small little people, clearly inspired by the dwarves of Tolkien and, and Narnia, um, who venerate a particular craft lord or an ancient figure called Birnamund. And it is around um, Birnamund's gems and crafted objects that the whole narrative you know revolve so basically the narrative in in a, in in typical fantasy fashion the narrative is about the end of the earth uh, which is approaching very swiftly and bernamund has made a prophecy thousands of years before that um the collection or the retrieval of his gems um uh, which are which somehow correspond to each and every season uh, would uh, would help you save the annihilation of uh, uh, of the planet itself. Now it's interesting. The whole the, these are very thick books actually, and the whole um, descriptions are filled with um, you know a kind of a reverence towards craftsmanship. But interestingly, also um, they are also about the link between craftsmanship and nature, which again go back um, goes back to certain principles of the arts and crafts movement. So, for instance, the first quote here. Uh, describes the uh, the beauty and the fragility and the perfection of the jewels that Birnamund made. The gems of Birnamund held a fragile beauty and a perfection that endowed their possessors with a sense that they were guardians, not owners, not just of those artifacts, but of the earth itself, right? So immediately, I mean, they're, they're, they're constantly the, the books are making a certain kind of a you know, relationship between good craftsmanship and literally the preservation of earth itself, which uh, which kind of evokes Morris's um, very famous quote where uh, he said that everything made by man's had 
hands has a form which must be either beautiful or ugly beautiful if it is in accord with nature and helps her or ugly if it is discordant with nature interestingly uh, one of the key hidden figures who leads this search for the four uh, four gems that correspond to each and every you know, season of the earth it's called Bedwin Stort, and the way uh, Howard describes Bedwin Stort also reminds us of the polymathic identities of Morris and Ruskin themselves. So his quote is describing Stort: "That Stort was a scrivener, inventor, traveler, savant, and searcher after truth and solutions to problems, scientific, secular, spiritual, and paradoxical. In fact, anything that caught his imagination and fired his insatiable curiosity about how things worked and in what and exactly where the answers to." Mother Earth's mysteries lay. So um, this this is I mean anyone who's interested in in the kind of links between arts and crafts movement and um, uh, uh, and it, I mean and and nature in in a in a contemporary novelistic setting should certainly pick up these very beautiful written novels. The most uh, famous fantasy, I would say, uh, fantasy novel and trilogy of of our times is definitely by by. Um, Philip Pullman, his dark materials that, that were written between 1995 to 2000, and uh, he's still writing certain sequels to uh, to them. The books are very, very complex and um, and and deal with a whole lot of themes, but primarily they are about uh, they they um, they focus on the magical force of dust, which is basically equal to say dark matter, but Pullman also magicalizes it, and dust is associated with consciousness. Interestingly, dust also settles around things that are crafted in uh, crafted in nature, and um, the the whole uh, the trilogy is anchored by uh, uh, these two children, Lyra and Will. But in the third book, uh, the Amber Spyglass, which is the which is the final book as well. Another character is uh, is there who gains uh, a, a lot of sort of narrative, you know, um, a description by the name of Mary Malone, who's actually a scientist uh, from Oxford, and she's also on her quest for dust and quest for dark matter. She and uh, she enters a, a parallel world called the, which is dominated by these magical elephant looking like creatures um uh, called called the mulefa i'm sure some of you must have watched the hbo adaptation as well and um interestingly it is only once she assimilates herself in that society and which is also kind of a society of craftspeople people itself that and when this sort of symbiotic relationship between mary and the mulefa develops that she is able to understand the nature of dust and also able to invent the tool, the amber spyglass, the titular amber spyglass that allows her to see dust for the first time. But before that happens, Pullman spends pages and pages of describing how the assimilation and introductions of both the both the two people basically takes place. So here, are, for instance, the, in the first quote describes Mary seeing the Mulefa. Um, you know, work in the community. Little by little, Mary came to see the way everything was like linked together, and all of it seemingly managed by the Malefa. They knew the location of every herd of grazers, every stand of wheel trees, every clump of sweet grass, and they knew every individual within the herd, discussed their well-being and faith. Nothing was wasted. Mary watched their everyday life, uh, sorry, everyday work with pleasure. She felt at seeing anything done well. It's again a very Morrison idea that that gets evoked here and but it also uh, goes back to what senate says that learning to work well enables people to govern themselves and so become good citizens yeah um, so very very ethical idea here in and uh, similarly the Mulefa are also understruck by mary's uh, by mary's hands because they don't have hands they they work with their sort of um uh, you know uh, uh, with with their body parts and all the other body parts, but not with, they don't have the hands. So Malefa are wonderstruck by Mary's hands and can't get enough of them. Their delicate trunks felt every other joint, searching out thumbs, knuckles, and fingernails, flexing them gently, and they watched with amazement as she picked up her uh, uh, her rucksack. And it's interesting. So Bullman keeps supplying us with these multiple multiple descriptions. And only when this kind of, as I, as I was saying, uh, this kind of recognition of each other's efforts, um, you know, and, and craftsmanship as it were happens, is she able to make the instrument with the help of uh, of the Malefa, which then helps her 
sea dust, the, the, the magical force, which is receding from the world. And it's interesting what Ingold, uh, when he talks about tools, what does he say? That tools are intended not to control, but to reveal. And they're used not in a failed attempt to achieve emancipation from an alien world of nature, but in a successful attempt to draw the inhabitants of that world into an unbounded sphere of intimate social sociality. And I think this is exactly what Morris and Ruskin are, and other other I mean people from 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 the Arkham class movement are also doing right that they are whenever they're talking about different kinds of handicrafts they are never handicrafts or or handwork as such or labor as such is never an end to itself it is never supposed to um, uh, you know uh, it, it it doesn't necessarily um, you know uh, how to put it? It, it, it it's supposed to uh, nurture you and nurture good life rather than being an end in itself yeah and that's exactly what tool work is also about um uh, what what ingold is saying and what Pull, pullman is also demonstrating through um through his novels as well okay i can go on and on uh, with various other examples from the american tradition as well if you look at lev grossman's the magician series or Tamara Porce's uh, The Circle of Magic. I mean, there are many, many writers who are constantly talking and are very interested in showing, depicting haptics. But I will end with two slides here, which uh, talk about the, the new Indian fantasy uh, productions that have been taking place that, that, have, that have kind of become a rage over the last two, uh, two decades at least. And here I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Mahabharata, the world's longest epic. Um, which has been um, ad adapted many, many times. Importantly, um, uh, in India and in the Indian context, mytho whenever we talk about fantasy, we have to talk about mythology because for the longest part, uh, mythologies have been treated as fantasies in their own in their own right and even when television came into um, I mean in India in the 1980s the first few serials that were made by the national television DT Doordarshan were these epics basically. This one uh, that, that you have on your screen this adaptation is, is a recent adaptation from 2013 um, which is for me it was I mean um, uh, possibly the best adaptation of, of, of the epic which basically it was interesting that how they would they were also focusing on the look and feel of um of, of of the of the narrative i mean apart from many other things the the focus was how do we make it different from the 19, 1988 version which is the first version of the Mahabharata and constantly the, the discussions that were taking place were about how do we create a new crafted appeal about this old show. So there was even a temporary museum uh, being displayed in various malls of Mumbai, um, you know, dedicated to the handicrafts and, and the textiles and everything that was being shown in, the, in this particular adaptation. And they even adapt, uh, they even roped in Bhanu Adhaya, the um, the Oscar winning costume uh, costume designer um, who, who clearly went on stage to say that this Mahabharata will revive Indian handicrafts. Okay, what other the, the last thing that I was I will say in this, my last slide here is that interestingly, in 1980, in the 1988 version, when Mahabharata was being narrated, it was time, it was a disembodied figure of time and a wheel of time that was narrating the whole story um but interestingly when this version got made in 2013 it was um the figure of um uh, figure of Lord Krishna, who also becomes a central character in the epic itself, who becomes a narrator. And whenever he would start an episode or end or sort of punctuate the episode, uh, uh, you know, in in between and and give a couple of sort of say, spiritual sermons or moral sermons, he would be shown in terms of a maker or practitioner figure. So there was a kind of a heavy material consciousness about his figure. So often they would show him, you know, making pots or statues or playing the flute and and through that through those materials um, basically philosophizing about about the various aspects of uh, of spiritual life okay and um so so um and this kind of a this kind of a heavy material consciousness is something that you also get to see in a lot of contemporary young adult fantasies in that are now being written since 2000 2005 onwards in um, in India, including one of my favorite books by uh, Giti Chandra, the Book of Guardians, where again uh, the protagonists and the magician figures are actually shown as skilled doers in the form of artists and musicians and all. Okay, but and the last point, the concluding point that I want to 
uh, make here is not that these new adaptations are influenced by the arts and crafts movement. That's not the link that I'm trying to make. But I um, but but the fact that these these productions, both literary and visual productions, are heavily influenced by the influence that arts and crafts has on the Western fantasy tradition, because it was only after the huge success and popularity of books like Harry Potter, as well as its films and Lord of the Rings and Narnia in the Indian context post-2000, that um, that fantasy productions that both in the literary and visual sense um, got a new kind of a Philip, you know, creative Philip to experiment with their uh, materiality, as it were, in, in, in a new way. So I know this is a kind of a, a rushed up summary of, of, a, of a whole thesis or two, but I, I look forward to your questions. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you so much for attending uh, attending my talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Siddharth, for that really interesting exploration. Um, I'd now like to uh, welcome our next speaker live on Zoom. Hello. Um, Kaya Ninnis. Kaya Ninnis is a design historian and cultural researcher based in Berlin and Munich. Currently, she's a research associate at the Department of Cultural History and Theory at Humboldt University in Berlin. As a member of the doctoral program of the Cluster of Excellence Matters of, Matters of Activity, she investigates the arts and crafts movement from an eco-critical perspective. She is also the co-founder of Art Material Ecology, a working group for the study of material flows and infrastructures. Welcome, Kaya. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Siddharth for this um, super rich and very interesting exploration, um, which I've, yeah, I, I would like to um, uh, get together and talk more about. Um, also, thank you for the kind introduction um, and also the invitation to come and speak in this context. I'm very sad uh, that I can't be there with you all. And um, I'm, missing, I'm sure I'm missing a lot of uh, interesting discuss discussions after the panels have finished. Um, but I still hope that my input can maybe uh, spark one or two extra discussions um, later. So uh, in the introduction yesterday, Antonia Bihan asked, how can we go about tracing a global history of the arts and crafts movement? And um, I propose that we could do this through looking at materials and material histories. My presentation today is based on my PhD project, which is currently titled Histories of Transformation, Tracing Materials in the British Arts and Crafts Movement. As I've only started my PhD position in June of this year, um, this presentation won't be focusing too much on results and rather on proposing and thinking about um, a kind of methodolo meth um, a, a methodological approach to creating, uh, to, to thinking through materials in creating um, historical narratives. And I will conclude my presentation with showing um, you two at the moment uh, still incomplete case studies. So uh, I would like to begin this presentation by setting the scene and going back in time um, to the site of an event that's probably uh, overly familiar to most of you in the room. And um, that is the Great Exhibition of 1851. The first volume of the illustrated catalog contains a map with a very long title, uh, The Geographical View of the Great Exhibition of 1851, showing in one view the relative and ter territorial distribution of the various localities from whence the raw materials and manufacturers contributed to the exhibition have been severally supplied. So zooming in on the British Isles, colorful blobs mark the areas of British manufacture. Yellow for cotton, pink for wool, blue for cutlery and hardware and so forth. Now, moving a little bit to the left uh, of, of the British Isles, we have uh, smaller and less detailed maps of the colonies and the United States, seemingly devoid of any manufacturing activities of their own, judging from the lack of colorful blobs. The yellow dot marking the cotton <coughs> manufacture in Dakar, today's capital of Bangladesh, is the only exception. The Presence of raw materials in and on the land is then again marked by black capital letters, 
sugar, coffee and cotton in the West Indies. I'm sure uh, it's a little bit too small to read. Um, coal in the United States and coal and timber in the case of Canada, which you can see enlarged on the right. Placed in the main aisle in front of the entrance, visitors to the Canadian section at the Great Exhibition encountered the Timber Trophy, a large triangle stru triangular structure incorpor uh, which incorporates a variety of woods sourced from Canadian forests in different stages of manufacture. From rough, unprocessed planks and logs at the bottom, to varnished boards that make up the body of the structure, to the birch bark canoe used for logging and fishing at the top. The jawbone of a sperm whale is lent against the, the structure as a reference to shipbuilding, completing what can quite literally be called a triumphant display of man over nature, industry over native lands and forests. Now allow me to share a, 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 a little bit longer passage from an article published in the Illustrated London News describing this uh, timber trophy and that uh, the, the description of the journalist echoes quite strongly this notion of uh, precious unused land which is finally being made profitable by British settlers. For the timber, it too is there rightfully enough, reminding us that even England a few centuries ago was thick set with forests and that the first work toward her present busy industry was to fell the old timber and let the sunlight warm the earth. Man is no dweller of the woods. Go where he may, the forest must bow before him. He clears a field for himself and drives the plough into the soil, grows crops of annual provender for himself and his beasts of burden, and fills the land with busy, multi busy multitudes. We would have the visitor to the Great Exhibition therefore pause a little by the timber trophy. It may remind them of the settlers in those regions, of those who go forth to found fresh centers of commerce. 27 years later, 27 years after the Great Exhibition, John Beats first published his book, The Natural History of Raw Materials of Commerce, in which he addressed young men engaged in mercantile pursuits, providing them with a knowledge of the earth and its productions. This book, uh, I, I see a pattern forming, also contains a map and with an even more detailed account of global resource distribution. Here I'm showing uh, as an example, um, randomly chosen, the raw materials of commerce in South America. Conceptualizing the earth as a vast storehouse, Yeats upholds the, upholds the narrative proposed by the journalist of the Illustrated London News, namely that it takes a certain kind of humanity to recognize the value of resources and increase their productivity. Quote, we do not merely gather the indigenous materials of the country we live in, but by intelligent industry, we increase the natural production through agriculture and through, indus through industry. A country's civilization, according to Yeats, can be measured by the extent of knowledge about raw materials and their productivity. While civilized nations, such as in this case, the British, increase their knowledge, quote, Barbar barbarous tribes merely pass their time in providing for their recurring appetites and cannot be said to enjoy existence in the sense of mental enjoyment. Following here, um, Adeline Buckland, that means that to be a raw material at, uh, in the 19th century was to be a, quote, meaningless plant or rock or animal or person, often in a far off land from the putative side of power and to be imagined as actualized by the mighty intellectual, physical and spiritual powers of empire. Now, now that I've set the scene, I will um, start talking about the arts and crafts. Um, I just realized that I'm not mentioning William Morris once in my talk, um, but I'm, I, I set all of these things and show you all of these images because uh, I feel that, um, because that's exactly the, the scene in which the arts and crafts movement in Britain at least emerged. 
a time heavily influenced by and concerned with the expansion of empire and thus gaining access to uh, raw materials that would then feed British manufacturers or um, keeping the access to uh, raw materials. So in regards to the arts and crafts, many authors have highlighted um, in regards to the arts and crafts and materials, many authors have highlighted the use of local materials as an arts and crafts design principle, especially those placing the movement at the beginning of a history of sustainable thought and design. To my knowledge, uh, some protagonists, and this is especially true in the realm of architecture, um, they actually did ad advocate this ideal. For example, Walter Crane, uh, we heard of him um, yesterday, or at least um, the parts that I was able to witness. He deemed local materials to be the, quote, secret of harmonious effects in building. However, this, I, this statement is then also contradicted by other protagonists from the movement. Um, for example, Thomas Copton Sanderson, who praised medieval craftsmanship <clears throat> when, according to him, people were joyously working, quote, upon all sorts and kinds of materials, materials brought from afar, sought with danger, or grown in pastoral peace. Then again, we find examples where attempts to source materials locally failed completely. Albert Fleming and Marion Twelves, for example, who initiated the Langdale linen industry in the Lake District in the 1880s, wanted to grow flax in the Langdale Valley as part of a small-scale linen industry that could then support the impoverished rural community, mainly um, the older women living there and couldn't find, and couldn't, uh, find any work. These attempts uh, failed for unknown reasons, um, but Fleming ended up importing flax in bundles from Ireland. Similarly, Harold Rathbone, founder of the Della Robbia Pottery in Birkenhead, planned to source clay from the nearby Wirral Sea coast. After realizing, however, that the, uh, this clay from the, from the Wirral Sea coast was absolutely unsuitable for um, application in the decorative arts, because it was very coarse and was usually only used for brick manufacture, he resorted to buying clay from a supplier in Stoke-on-Trent. Um, and they probably, um, we can assume, uh, got their clay from the south, the southwest of the British Isles. <clears throat> May Morris argues in her essay of materials that the, quote, cool, silky surface of linen is more suitable to English people than cotton. Quote, each country rightly choosing the material nearest to hand. Randomly chosen from Morris's body of embroidery work, these examples that I'm showing here uh, reveal that Morris uh, embroidered as, uh, on linen as well as silk fabrics, which would have felt equally cool and silky, but were not exactly near to hand. It is likely that the silk itself was originally imported from India. The objects reveal her statement to exist first and foremost as a design principle, a hypothesis, a projection of what she felt was most natural. The ideal of the local material ended up entering craft practice only partially. These reappearing contradictions between ideal and practice made me turn to the objects themselves and ask, where did the material actually come from? So in my dissertation, I want to reconsider the local and global resource streams that are connected with arts and crafts objects that are currently being held in various different museum collections, uh, focusing on the material that they are made of. Um, and the research itself focuses, uh, is, focuses on the ecological and social implications of the procurement and transformation of those materials and tracing them along sides of transformation. Um, those could be, for example, the workshop, the quarry, the mine, the plantation. I will then explore relations between processes of material transformation, the environment, and human as well as non-human actors. On a larger scale, and this is where we get into the uh, narrative um, question, I want to explore possibility, the possibilities of an eco-critical materials-based approach to design history in other words, rereading the history of the arts and crafts movement eco-critically 
through its materials and hopefully finding out what happens when we put materials at the center of art and design historical narratives. In the case of the arts and crafts movement, um, the British arts and crafts movement, the materials perspective uh, is able to shed light on um, a part that uh, has not been um, as much explored, um, and that is its entanglements with the extractive activities of the British Empire. So, as I said before, uh, I've actively been working on my PhD um, for a couple of months now and will present the initial findings of two yeah, very uh, incomplete case studies, but which might be able to give you an idea where this research um, might go in the future. So this is the Brüchern Museum in Berlin, which is my first collaboration partner. It's named after its founder, industrialist and art collector Karl H. Brüchern. And the museum today houses a diverse collection of Art Nouveau, Art Deco, Functionalism and works from the Berlin succession, ranging from paintings over graphics, um, applied art, furniture, so a very, very wide range. And it is also home um, to, as estimated by myself, um, the largest collection of arts and crafts objects in Berlin. This collection grew significantly in 2019 on occasion of the Bauhaus 100 years anniversary when several pieces of furniture and a Morris and Co tapestry were acquired to become part of the exhibition. And here you see the poster for it. It would translate to From Arts and Crafts to Bauhaus, Art and Design a New Union. The first object from the museum collection that caught my eye was a very humble dinner fork, um, which you saw on a slide earlier. And that was because it was said to have a Bakelite handle. So and a very early plastic and um, which was the first to be made completely out of synthetic compounds. And I would argue that that is not something that you would immediately associate with the arts and crafts movement. Um, but that was very intriguing to me. So I started looking into it. Um, this fork was part of a cutlery set designed by Charles Randy McIntosh, and according to the Bruhan Museum archive, it was designed for the Chinese room in the Ingram, Ingram Street Tea Room in Glasgow. So one of many uh, of several Glasgow tea rooms run by Catherine Cranston or following the stem on the back side of the fork. Here you um, a picture of it, Miss Cranston. Just to give you a, a quick visual of what this space would have looked like, where the fork um, is supposedly um, was at home. Um, um, here on the left, you can see a black and white photograph from the room taken in the 1940s. So the room was finished in 1911, um, and that, that's um, a few years after its completion. And on the right, uh, in, in the uh, floor plan, you see the a purple marked space uh, in 205 Ingram Street, which is where the Chinese room would have been. It's also in, in this um, depiction, it's marked also as the blue room, and that is because these um, lattices or screens um, that you can see on the, on the photograph would have been painted uh, bright blue. Returning to the fork now. Bakelite was patented in New York in 1909, and the Chinese room, as I just said, was completed two years after that. And we know that in the Chinese room, uh, Macintosh had already experimented with early plastic, so it would make sense that the handle is also um, made from some kind of uh, early plastic. <clears throat> However, um, it is not clear that it is actually made of Bakelite. The same fork is held in the Glasgow School of Art archives and described as having a handle made, made of a black composite. And uh, this, uh, yeah, this opens up a variety of other extrudable materials used in the cutlery industry at the time, such as xylonite, ivorite, or the widely used celluloid. So where do I go from here? <clears throat> um, as uh, a next step, I plan to collaborate with material scientists and or conservators who can help me to specify 
the material that was actually uh, that this handle is actually made of and i was i have been told uh, that that's possible for example by using infrared spectros spectroscopy um and assuming that i that i can find out what material this um black handle is made of i can then investigate further so asking where was the handle made and what were the working conditions for example like what raw materials were involved where did these um, where did these raw materials and compounds where were they extracted refined and or processed were there for example issues of toxicity at play are these processes then again connected with uh, issues of pollution or environmental harm and if so was in this case Charles Ring Macintosh aware of any of it Apart from material analysis, which is one route I can uh, I, I plan to go in, in finding out more about these material histories, there's also, of course, the possibility to find object-specific information on material histories in the archives of individual designers or manufacturers. So I turned my attention to this arms, armchair um, made at the Dresdner Werkstätte für Handwerkskunst in Germany, their archive conveniently being only a three hour train ride from Berlin. So it makes uh, the experiment to see how far the archive can, how far I can actually get in the archive with my questions a little bit more accessible. Now, before you get your hopes up, I have not been able to visit this archive yet. I will be going soon at the beginning of next year and hoping to find clues in correspondence, invoices pertaining material purchases, inventory lists, or names of suppliers. This chair <clears throat> um, was originally designed for an exhibition which took place in 1903 at the Dresdner Werkstätte für Handwerkskunst, showcasing 30 interior design ensembles by regional and international designers at the Municipal Hall in Dresden. In preparation for the exhibition, Karl Schmidt, head of the workshop, went on a field trip to Britain and Scotland to expand his network of renowned designers and manufacturers. Beforehand, he had contacted Hermann Mutesius, who at the time was working in London as a delegate reporting on the latest developments in the field of English architecture. And then he asked him for a list of people who were creating, quote, extraordinary things. On that list, um, there was the name Mackay Hughes Baby Scott, who ended up designing two rooms for the exhibition, a bedroom, which you can see on the right side, and a ladies sitting room, both containing versions of this armchair. The one in the ladies sitting room here on the left is made of black alder and pear wood, quote, in which the mother of pearl and ivory intarsia gleam like jewels, as Heinrich Wendtik describes in his first hand account of his visit to the exhibition. The armchair in the Bröcher Museum was originally designed for Scott's bedroom ensemble, and it's made of a flamed birch wood with mother of pearl and ivory inlays. The chair was bought in 1997 at auction without the original upholstery. The green um, upholstery that you could see here was added later in accordance with the color scheme that baby Scott designed for the bedroom. Now, it is known that the Dresdner Werkstätte aimed at producing simple and affordable furniture, which also influenced the choice of materials. Uh, one source stating that Karl Schmidt preferred to use local woods that could be acquired cheaply, while we can assume that birch grew in the area around Dresden at the beginning of the 20th century. The same cannot be said for ivory or mother of pearl. So at this point, this uh, case study is to be continued. <clears throat> that is uh, where I'm at at the moment, and I just quick uh, finally want to conclude by mentioning that um, how how I'm going to go on from here. It is uh, important to me to depict the diversity of the British arts and crafts movement or the nuances. Oh, I think my uh, screen sharing stopped, but there was not nothing important uh, left <laughs> anyway. Um, and uh, yeah, so depicting the diversity of the British arts and crafts movement in the way I pick my case studies. 
Uh, at the moment, I don't have a fixed group of objects that I will be investigating yet, and that's a conscious de decision. Um, but I will want to include case studies from rural context, uh, also maybe uh, anonymous um, of anonymous makers, and also women craft workers. And to this end, because the Bruhan Museum um, does not include either of those uh, categories in their collection, I will move on to um, other museums in the future. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to the discussion. Um, we have time for a few questions and comments. Um, Andrew will pass the mic to anyone who wants to raise their hand and, and ask a question or comment. And I think Siddharth and Kaya can see the room as well. Yes. I, I wanted to thank um, both presenters. And I had a question for Kaya, or maybe like a little common kind of question. Anyway, when we were you were talking about the extraction of materials and agency of the actors, um, I wanted to ask you if you were making a distinction between the makers as actors and also materials need to be, for example, if it's metal, then there's miners. So there's makers who are also involved in sort of processing the materials. So, that, so there's the whole, like, I think that's like wonderful, the mapping that you're trying to do. But I was just wondering if you're considering all the different types of actors on that route. So that, because that's, that's part of the empire building extraction. Um, thank you very much for your comment. Uh, and I, um, I mean, I can, the, the short answer would be yes, I, I will be uh, incorporating all the actors, or at least that's the goal. Um, so the, the, the article that it, um, it very much inspired my research um, is called uh, Creative Matter by uh, Laura Perna Aigo, and she did um, a very similar sort of investigation, and she describes the ecological unconscious of art matter. Um, and that means, in my understanding, all the actors and all the processes that are kind of being smoothed over um, when one only looks at the object. So finding out what, what happened before, and that absolutely includes uh, miners and as well as uh, uh, the, the makers, the, the people working the machines. Um, the So yeah. Absolutely, I will uh, try to make it as specific as possible. Or, for, um, but I, I'm finding that some of this information is very hard to come by, especially when to, when you want to stick to a certain um, material and time of of its its making, uh, because the object is my is my jumping off point. Thank you. Question for Siddharth. This is a question for Siddharth, and it's based on where I thought your talk was going to go from the title, but didn't. It was fascinating where it did go. But when I saw the word magical, I was thinking not of production within a larger context of magical narrative, but magic in the making itself, the enabling of a piece of carved wood to. Uh, entice and hold a god, the making, uh, smithing of metal that enables a shaman's communion with spirits represented in you know, animal helper form. Um, and I wondered if in this, you know, and there, I don't think there's much of that in the art, arts and crafts movement. I wondered though, if there were any sense of that in the crafting in the fiction that you were describing. I like Pinocchio. Uh, can I just, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, mm -hmm. you can, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, can I just sort of uh, clarify, so you, uh, so you're looking for sort of like in incidents or descriptions of making within the fantasy narratives and not just of makers? Uh, is that the question? Um, Sorry, I didn't get it exactly. Yes, if, if there you, is magic if you could just explain in it further. the making, in the narrating of the making, is magic assumed to be part of the Process. Yeah, that's that, thank you. So. Yeah, sure. Thank thank you so much for uh, for uh, for this question. So um, this is something that has 
that is well it started bothering me from the moment i started researching <laughs> because uh so how does making work it's interesting that here we are talking only about fantasy narratives so you you already are dealing with third or second degree order of reality it is not a realistic world and yet the argument that i was making was that whenever fantasy narrators uh, writers are are describing the process of making so for instance that example that i took from uh, pullman's book uh, his dark materials the, the amber spy glass the very last example before moving into the indian fantasy counterpart um they they are uh, those, those are just two quotes from uh, from mary malone and the mulefa community but otherwise if you read the book there are the whole book is i mean there are many many chapters just devoted to the making of the amber spy glass now what do we mean by the magic of making that it that that itself is a very i think it's a very thick and complicated and a complex idea why because it's what what drew me to this research was that although the the uh, the universes or the or the worlds that we are talking about are completely speculative they don't exist in the real world yet whenever the authors are describing the making of a particular instrument or a particular gem or what whatsoever it is the description is very realistic so your question whether it is magical or not is actually paradoxically tied to the question of how realistic it is because for me i mean what what i kind of concluded in my research was that it is, it is in the realism of the making of things itself that magic actually arises you know because it's not we all know that there is a magical force in harry potter and in philip pullman in in virtually every fantasy universe you pick up but interestingly um the 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 magic of making actually lies in the labor of it and also in the description of it so how good is a fantasy writer in describing that sense of making you know is uh, contributes to, to the magic of it i don't think so that i was actually looking for how a magical force enters the making of something but i was rather interested in the realistic description of making the descriptive power of of the of of, of you know the, the work of hand that somehow also contributed to a sense of the fantastical while remaining realistic itself so there so there is a paradox there in which i which i was trying to you know you know which i was trying to get um, get at basically yeah thank you yeah. thanks maybe i can um add to to that uh, discussion or maybe just ask maybe the materials also uh, add to the magic um because you just mentioned a amber spy glass right in a in a universe yeah. which is completely fictional um where also materials could be completely fictional um it is still uh, they they're still referring to amber um which is also known for being uh, associated with alchemy and kind of this this um idea of uh, yeah a very yeah, yeah. And it, idea exactly and this is not only the property of like fantasy literature but also fantasy cinema i mean you mm -hmm. know if you look at say how a potion is made in say harry potter for instance i mean rolling goes into lots and lots of details regarding the exact precise amount and the quality of material that goes into the making of a potion mm -hmm. it's not only her i mean there's there's a whole tradition of fantasy writing so all fantasists i mean many i think most of them anyone who is uh, you know really thickly involved with this process is is uh, will focus on the exact the precise quantity as well as the quality as well as a particular sort of you know um, for instance skill that is involved in the making of something if you remember harry potter and the half blood prince the second last film uh, on the 6th 6th it's a 6th novel right yeah uh, there when they are uh, like processing and making those potions and snakes class right everyone is getting it getting it wrong and the whole film and the book is about the exact sort of techniques the techne basically that is involved as well as the quantity and the quality of material that is involved in getting that particular potion right so i think there is a very thick material consciousness to any good fantasy writing or for that matter um, fantasy cinema as well yeah it it's very much an integral part yeah mm -hmm. Uh, materials. This is a question for Kaya. 
The Bakelite handled knives and forks were flanked by a solid silver plated looking spoon. And under the uh, list of materials, it said alpaca. What was alpaca to do with those objects? Yeah, a, a good question. Um, that's something, a word that you find a lot in, in German museum archives. Um, and it's basically a different uh, description of a nickel, a silicated nickel um, hmm. that was used. And also, I mean, I, I did do also the, so I only talked about the handle, of course, the metal part of the fork um, is also of a material and it's a silver plated nickel. Um, and there's definitely a lot to be said about nickel mining and the ecological effects of that that still last today. But um, again, I'm, I'm, um, it's probably uh, nickel from Canada, from from an, a mine in Ontario. But um, I, yeah, it's uh, that is something that I've also kind of put on ice for the moment um, until I find someone who can help me kind of specify um, these. Uh, the the the, anal the analysis of of the fork, but al alpaca is uh, basically silver plated nickel in uh, and it's a German word. I don't know why it's called alpaca. Any <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I. So it's it's kind of occurring to me as I was listening to both of your talks, which I have to say could not have been more up my alley as both a devoted fantasy reader, and thank you for the Tamara Pierce shout out, and and somebody really interested in kind of histories of materials and material flows. Um, one, a, a piece of connective tissue that I sort of see is the, the rise of a kind of eco-critical history in specifically Victorian literature studies and literary history. So I guess a kind of joint question would be, uh, you know, Kaya, I'm, I'm curious if you're kind of looking, in addition to this really great kind of material uh, based and an object based um, study, will you be kind of looking into these discourses and, and kind of fantasies and, and writings around uh, a kind of growing eco critical consciousness in the 19th century? And Siddharth, um, conversely, do you get a sense that the authors that you're, you know, studying and, and tracing these legacies were they, in some sense, uh, conscious of of this kind of same moment in in the 19th century? And thank you both. Um, thank you for the question and for finding common ground uh, between our um, talks. And of course, I mean the the, the eco criticism and the eco critical readings of uh, arts and crafts um, texts may, mainly were. One of the reasons why I fell in love with uh, with arts and crafts, uh, also because I found it, I found these texts very timely and very um, forward-looking and um, inspiring. So um, that's that's basically where the journey began. Um, however, um, um, I, in my experience, um, <clears throat> some of the the author, it's 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 often a very idealized. Um, version as or or maybe no let, let me rephrase um it i feel like these these uh for example histories of, of sustainable thought they usually focus on john ruskin and william morris as the main uh, protagonists but not necessarily on the arts and crafts movement which as we uh have established i think uh, by now is very wide and very diverse um so i think this also this idea of of uh yeah, of, of eco-criticism and of um, the uh, a, a sustainable legacy that began maybe in the in the 19th century, um, that that narrative would change when you when we actually look at the objects and the materials um, and how they how how the practice um, might have been sustainable. And I think and that's that's only like a hunch at the moment that that might be in the way people um, were structuring labor. That, that that might have been uh, what was actually the sustainable contribution um, in the British arts and crafts movement at, at the time. Um, but I'm very curious to hear what Siddharth has to say about this question. Yeah, thank, you. And thank you so much. I mean, like I am, I'm so happy that you see a connecting tissue, a thread between both of our talks. Uh, and in fact, the question itself, I feel is the, is the best connector between the between the talks. So yes, absolutely. I mean, there is a interesting that you are asking me this. So I started my PhD in 2014 and ended in, in 19. It's interesting that before um, 
before starting my PhD, I had absolutely no idea of the genre of nature writing or landscape writing. Of mm-hmm. course, there were a few random sort of, you know, writers famous for their nature descriptor, uh, descriptions and all. Uh, uh, I mean, in, I'm talking about the Indian context, but when I went to the UK, this was this massive boom of nature writing that was happening and has been happening for the last one to two decades, as we know. Of course, it all goes back. I mean, in the American tradition, it goes back to the 19th century, the, the Thoreauian tradition and Emerson and all of them. And even in, in England, we have, uh, as you said, from 19th century onwards. But it was interesting for me that as I started reading fantasy and my work was very much... Um, if we are to take forward that very artificial nature culture divide, my work was related more to culture than nature. And in, <laughs> but what started happening was that as I started delving into the theory and philosophy and the research histories of, of craftsmanship, I in and especially as depicted in fantasy universe is also evident from the examples, the very few examples that I took. I had to look at nature and I mean I was thrilled with that because uh, I, I could see that there is a clear kind of a connection and then when I you know when finally I encountered someone like Morris and when he makes this statement about that the best design and best craft has to be inspired by nature that was pretty much it so I uh, yes absolutely so uh, this whole tradition of uh, at least British British fantasy writing, which goes back to 19th century, especially, is very very conscious of. I feel um, and the the uh, and because the legacy of Tolkien is so huge, basically on literally any any contemporary or any 20th century you know writer that and, and because Tolkien himself was the most influenced by by. By, by Morris, you will invariably see those sort of, you know, influences of both nature and craft happening. But I also want to say that landscape is a very essential part of fantasy writing. I mean, you can't have, I don't think so, that you can have good fantasy writing without also having a good sense of landscape. And that is something which is a very intrinsic part of, of British fantasy, fantasy tradition. Also, what is happening is if you look at the new nature writers from Robert McFarlane to Helen MacDonald to many others who have been writing uh, now. And, and in fact, I've been researching nature writing as well. So that's my parallel research interest that started within my PhD. All of them at some point or the other, while they're writing, I mean, nature writing is about non-fiction, realistic worlds, fantasies, all about fictional worlds. So they couldn't be more apart. But in, it's interesting that both of these genres are constantly partaking each other. So people like Robert McFarlane or Helen MacDonald or many other contemporary writers writing in the nature writing tradition are also often referring to the uh, descriptions of Tolkien and Narnia and so on and so forth. You know, so there are lots. Of, if you start reading a lot of you know uh, a, a lot of contemporary nature writing, there'll be a lot of referencing of of fantasy narratives that that is taking place simultaneously. So that is something that I find really really fascinating. That despite being one set in a realistic world, another set in a completely fictional world, there are these synergies that are going on. And the final point I would like to make is um, the, the anthropologist philosopher who has influenced me the most, Tim Ingold. His whole work is devoted to nature and culture synthesis. Yeah. He's, he, uh, along with the, the anthropologist El- Elizabeth Hallam, I think he edited a book called Making and Growing. And the whole book is it's, it's a wonderful selection of essays that is dedicated to understanding the synergies between uh, making and growing as not opposite, but actually something which is inherently connected together. So, so yes, um, and th- this, these are two genres and two kind of streams of thought which are which are not at all uh, opposite to each other, but rather I would say singing to each other. Thank you again. I, question. I also uh, take. I mean, I also uh, have um, Tim Ingold in my in my reference list, of course, because of all the things you said about materials. Um, and I also take my current definition of material um, uh, from him, which is the stuff that things are made of, which I'm very grateful for. <laughs> Someone had to say it. Um, thank you so much. I think maybe just in, by way of wrapping this session up before we in person break for coffee, uh, I just wanted to offer a few comments. Um, this is Antonia. I don't think you can see me from your screen. Um, so one, one concept that I think both of you referred to, though didn't specifically call out, is the idea of alienation. And it occurs to me that alienation is often a problem of narration, 
uh, because it's a failure to place oneself and one's object and material culture within a larger landscape and society. And so narrating, being able to narrate and find those connections um, often does that work of, of restoring those connections um, between people, places, and things. Um, it occurred to me that, uh, you know, perhaps at some other point we can discuss the status of the object in, in both of your works, which seem to be both a point of connection and also a little bit of a divergence. Um, for Siddharth, you pointed out that the, it's not about the object itself, it's about social relations and the construction of subjectivity um, that these narratives and these descriptions are all about. And so in a sense, you dematerialize the object. It's, it's not about the thing. Um, whereas Kaya, you, you do, um, you're going towards social relations and looking at the wider landscape, but instead of dematerializing the object, really digging even further into its materiality and its specific objecthood and putting that at the center. Um, so I think those are really interesting ideas about well, what is the nature of the object and what is its status in relation to the wider network of social relations and this question of how we imagine ourselves um, and narrate our, our being in the world. So I think maybe, uh, can I just yeah, add, absolutely. Add one. Yeah, Thank you, yeah. Antonia. And that was beautifully, beautifully summarized. Uh, but I do want to add here that uh, what I've spoken here is just the first half of, uh, based on the first half of, half of my PhD. Because the thing about researching fantasy narratives is the, but, uh, that no matter how wonderfully uh, any great fantasy writer depicts human relations and human subjectivity in relationship to objects, the, 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 uh, there always comes a point in fantasy narratives when the material or the materiality of the object itself derives an agency of, or, of its own, mm -hmm. right? So for instance, it's the wand that selects Harry, it's not Harry who selects the wand. Mm -hmm. Or for instance, it's uh, it, it's the ring which starts calling out to, to Frodo and Bilbo Baggins, not the other way around, right? So interestingly, the, uh, my, uh, so, uh, interestingly the, the trajectory that my PhD and work also took was from starting from human relations on which I've spoken today, to what Kaya is actually speaking. So the ha the second half of my uh, of of my work was actually about how do we think about the agency of things in themselves. And these are all fictional, magical things. These are not the realistic things that Kaya is talking about. But nonetheless, uh, these are kind of two con contradictory, contrarian forces that are always at work in a fantasy text. And interestingly, when I started thinking about the non-human agency of um, a non-human agency of uh, of objects in fantasy literature. I mean, you have to then start thinking and you know looking at object-oriented ontology and so so many other recent theories that are coming out on uh, on the, on the work of objects and the lives of objects. Um, I didn't encounter this particular artistry work then during my PhD, but after I had finished, I came across this beautiful book, a very strange philosophical book, which I'm sure many of you would be knowing, the Sympathy of Things which is on, on the legacy of Ruskin mm. uh, and how Ruskinian and arts and crafts thought can be actually used in order to talk about uh, the agency of objects in themselves. So I think I also, actually my work is also going in the direction that Kaya took. I just chose for this particular presentation to focus on human relations. So hey, that is yeah. it, but thank you so much. I, I think yeah. that, um we can agree with one of your initial quotations, which is, this is uh, an endless quest. Um, and perhaps we will pause on our quest um, for us here in the room to go have coffee outside um, and to let you go from Zoom. So thank you so much. In this session, we'll be looking at a variety of arts and crafts and craft revival across the Middle East, including uh, questions about collecting, uh, tradition and change, and um, the influence of colonial regimes in the area as well. Uh, with that, I'll let Sarah introduce our first speaker. Hi. Um, our first speaker is Marcus Milwright. He is a British 
Academy Global Professor in the Department of History of Art, University of York, and Professor of Islamic Art and Archaeology at the University of Victoria, Canada. His research focuses on the art and archaeology of the Islamic Middle East, labor and craft practices, and cross-cultural contacts in the medieval and uh, the medieval Mediterranean. He has created the Crafts of Syria, Crafts of Iraq, and Talking About Art websites. His book includes Islamic Arts and Crafts, an anthology, and The Queen of Sheba's Gift, a history of true balsam of Matearea. Welcome, Marcus. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, thank you to Antonia for organizing this wonderful conference. And, and also thank you for the uh, generous uh, introduction. Um, so if we're thinking about um, the creation of modernist art um, in regions like uh, Syria and Iraq, we tend to look at the mid 20th century figures like uh, Fateh Mudaris in uh, Syria, um, and also uh, Jawad Salim, uh, Shakir uh, Hassan al-Said, um, and Faik Hassan in Iraq. Um, and what we see in these artists is an embrace of uh, principles of uh, Cubism and Surrealism, particularly and other elements of um, sort of European uh, modernist tradition. Particularly influential in this was the foundation by Jawad Salim and others of the uh, Jamaat uh, uh, Baghdad uh, Lil, Fa, uh, Lil Fan Al Hadith, uh, the uh, Baghdad Modern Art Group uh, in 1951. So, in that, you know, sort of it, it suggests a kind of a story that starts uh, in the sort of second quarter of the 20th century. Um, and, and the creation of this sort of embrace of modernity. But in fact, if we look earlier in the uh, 19th um, and into the early 20th century, we can see other types of engagement with uh, the modern world. And I'm going to be looking at that particularly in relation to um, a group of uh, chased brass vessels uh, produced uh, in Iraq in the early part of the 1920s. Um, where this intersects with uh, the subject matter of the conference is in the delicate balance um, that exists uh, between the engagement with the modern world, um, and particularly as we'll see, mechanised warfare, um, and um, existing modes of manufacturing and ornamentation. So in order to provide some context for the examination of these chaste uh, objects, I'll offer some comments about uh, the evidence for manufacturing in metal and other media um, in the late 19th and early 20th century, and for the depiction of the crafts in textual and visual forms um, in European and Arabic sources. What I want to argue is that some elements of the transformation of uh, traditional crafts were well established by the early years of the 20th century, but that events such as the World, uh, World War I had a critical impact on the nature of craft activities in the Middle East for the remainder of the century. In this context, it's worth reflecting on a central principle um, of the Baghdad Modern Art Group, which is uh, that of Istilham al Torath, um, uh, and this uh, translates as drawing inspiration from tradition. We see it in uh, the work of the artists associated with that group in that they're drawing on uh, the ancient heritage of Iraq, um, you know, sort of, uh, predictably, and we see that in things like the Monument of Freedom created by uh, Jawad Salim, never finished, but commissioned in 1959. But at the same time, you know, they're looking at uh, the medieval arts of Iraq, um, and notably things like the uh, newly published at that time um, Makamat of Al Hariri, uh, uh, an illustrated manuscript dating to 1237. So I think that this, although it's coined by the Baghdad uh, Modern Art Group, this concept um, is very useful um, in that it allows us to think about the very experimental quality of the revivalist art that's produced um, in the Middle East um, at that time. And I think like many revivalist movements uh, in Europe and elsewhere, this going back into the past is a profoundly modern 
activity. Um, and so I think you know, we can see that uh, very vividly um, in uh, the examples we're going to look at. Uh, so which, which is my uh, slide? Oh, I haven't got the slide. Oh, there we go. Right. Okay, great. Thank you. So I'm starting um, with uh, some images. Um, these are things I've been engaging with for a while, which are um, late 19th, early 20th century photographs, often stereoscopic uh, photographs, which show aspects of, um, of craft activities um, that are existing in uh, places like Syria uh, and uh, modern-day Lebanon. We've got here uh, the making of uh, inlaid woodwork um, and of silk. Uh, silk uh, was a huge industry in Lebanon, uh, but largely destroyed by the influx of um, uh, modern textiles from, um, from Europe uh, in the early part of the 20th century. But I think in the present context, it's also worth looking at the captions that are produced uh, with these images, the, the use of terms like crude and primitive here. So although there is some sort of underlying admiration for the work itself, there's also this acknowledgement of, or from a European or North American perspective, of the fact that these are, are primitive in relation to mechanized industry. And I think that you know, we can actually trace uh, some of this back further um, if we think about you know, some of the earliest European representations of Middle Eastern crafts, as we see, for instance, in the description de l'Egypte in the early part of the twentieth uh, early part of the nineteenth century, again there is this idea of the unchanging East, and and of you know, while things are beautifully made, they're made again according to uh, you know sort of very uh, long held um, and, and in some sense kind of stagnant crafts. This, of course, completely. Uh, avoids looking at the, the very dynamic nature of crafts um, and the way in which they are constantly adapting technologies and adapting to circumstances we're going to see uh, later on. So we can trace you know, some of these thoughts also through into uh, the mandate period um, in Palestine, Transjordan and, uh, and Syria, uh, you know, uh, the British and French mandates and these attempts to revive crafts. And as we've heard yesterday, these, often, uh, these revivals often privilege a particular type of things that you know, the, the, the colonial authorities thought were important rather than necessarily what uh, would have been uh, chosen from an indigenous perspective. Now, there are Arabic sources which also deal with the same issue, and perhaps the most extraordinary of these is the Kamul Sassinat Shamia, uh, the Dictionary of, Craft, of the Crafts of Damascus. Um, and this was written between about 1890 and it probably finished in about 1908, judging by references to the completion of the Hejaz Railway. It was never quite completed, but it contains over 400 separate chapters, each devoted to a specific craft. Now, the motivations for writing this um, are interesting because it's not written by craftspeople. It's written actually by three notables from uh, Damascus, two who are religious scholars and one who is a bureaucrat. Um, and they actually look at the crafts often from a, a quite an economic perspective. They're looking at um, the viability of particular crafts, who makes them. Uh, they talk also about you know, the um, confessional divisions within the crafts as well. But they're interested in the fact that crafts are disappearing. And often that this is happening in a quite complex way. Um, it's not always just manufactured goods coming in from Europe, but it's a sort of ripple effect um, of... Uh, the interactions of particular crafts um, and also things like changing fashions um, so that you know the move to cigarette smoking uh, led the uh, makers of uh, the stems of clay of, of the traditional tobacco pipes to, the, to start making uh, cigarette holders instead so so we do see again that sort of dynamism um, underlying this the other point to make is that you know, we do see right at the end of uh, the 19th century the emergence of uh, mechanized factories um, in uh, places like Egypt and Syria into the early part of the 20th century. But at the same time, you know, there are dynamics which are changing craft practices from much earlier. So when we're thinking about you know, these changes that are happening in the 19th century, we need to reflect on the fact that 
in the Camus, uh, they don't have a section about glazed pottery because it had already disappeared by the time they were writing in uh, the 1890s from Damascus. What you see on the screen here is an example of, uh, in, of watermarked paper. Uh, there's no practice of watermarking in uh, Islamic paper. And what we see from the late 15th century and particularly into the 16th is the disappearance of handmade paper making across the Islamic world and uh, the consumption instead of um, watermarked paper from Europe. So if we go through to the um, sort of later 19th century, we see the emergence of very interesting kind of revivalist uh, movements, and, and perhaps uh, the most powerful of these in, in places like Syria, Greater Syria and Egypt is the Mamluk revival. This is a revival of uh, one of the kind of golden ages of, um, of history. Uh, the Mamluk dynasty ruled between uh, 1250 and 1517, but um, it's particularly the works which were produced in the 14th century which get uh, copied most extensively. Now, these are um, difficult things to study because of the absence of makers' names and dates on all but a handful um, of examples. There are a few fixed points um, that we can note, though, um, that the cabinet that you can see is often uh, rather incorrectly named as a cursi. Um, it, it is a direct copy of a piece uh, which was made for the 14th century Sultan and Nasr Muhammad ibn Kala'un. Um, that piece is dated to um, 1328 and actually has the name of the maker, a man called Muhammad ibn Sumkur al-Baghdadi al-Sinai. What you're seeing on the screen, though, is, is a copy. And we know that the original was first exhibited in the Mosque of Baibars in Cairo in 1880. It then was transferred to the Museum of Arab Art once it was founded in 1884. And it was also illustrated in the Builder magazine um, in 1884. So the thing is that it's, it's a publicly accessible piece. And we know that... Um, the workshop of Giuseppe Parvis, um, who's also known as Yusuf Parvis, um, produced a series of copies of this, um, which were then um, circulated. Some even went to the top copy uh, in Istanbul. But after that, it was copied very extensively. And, and probably what we're seeing is the copying of copies. So increasingly, it's not based on the original, but rather it's based on um, a sort of secondhand versions. We can see it in this uh, example because um, the name of the maker in the original piece is actually in one of these six rectangles at the bottom here, but those are missed out and inscriptions that actually belong up at the top are simply repeated around the bottom. This piece in uh, one of two in the uh, Doris Duke Foundation uh, for Islamic Art in Shangri-La in Honolulu. So this points up the fact that while you have the idea of copying prototypes. In fact, after a while, it becomes the use of motifs in all sorts of new and different contexts. So this is another, this is the top of another copy of uh, the Kursi. Um, this one in the Azam, uh, this one's, oh, this was in the collection of Erica Dodd. Uh, but you can see how the central roundel has actually been lifted here and put into an entirely different setting. And then you know, the whole of uh, the, the top design has been then placed onto a tray um, in this other example. So this would suggest, you know, pattern books and the moving of motifs into, um, into these new environments. So much to be said about that, but I'm going to uh, move on because I want to kind of get on to the, um, the, the Iraqi pieces and the context of the First World War. Um, so very briefly, I'm just noting the fact that we have, uh, you know, during the First World War, the, 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 the two major fronts of battle um, in uh, the Middle East were the Palestine campaign and the Mesopotamian campaign. And they themselves were loaded with revivalist imagery. So um, Allenby, as he walked through, Dama uh, through the Damascus Gate into, uh, oh, sorry, the Jaffa Gate into um, Jerusalem, um, he was uh, lauded as um, being like a crusader, and, uh, you know, like the figure of uh, Richard Lion the Lionheart. In a bizarre poster from Cincinnati, he's also equated with Judah Maccabee um, uh, because he happened to kind of walk in during Hanukkah. Um, 
And then we have other kind of images such as uh, Mark Sykes, the uh, um, co-author of the notorious Sykes-Pico agreement. Um, his um, uh, memorial at Sledmere actually shows him as a crusader knight. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a sort of another topic uh, to be discussed another time. But what we do see during the First World War, again, is this very um, uh, sort of experimental use of materials. This is a piece in a private collection in Victoria. It's a cigarette box, um, and it's actually made out of uh, artillery shell cases. Um, and this is part of that long tradition of trench art, and we think of it very much in relation to the Western Front, but in fact trench art was being produced in all of the uh, theatres of war during the First World War. So the, the piece itself, the markings tell us that it was made in Germany in 1911, but the decoration, which has been added to the two artillery shell cases, um, dates probably to uh, you know, sort of, uh, somewhere after 1917. But what we have here is this very broadly kind of Mamluk revival technique being applied onto uh, an industrially made uh, object. Some of them um, also relate to specific events, such as the actual capture of um, Damascus by uh, Allied and Arab troops um, in 1917. And indeed, these objects were often made for soldiers, uh, such as the, the one you see on uh, the screen here is in the Al Arish uh, Museum in Australia because it was taken back by one of the Australian troops who are actually at the vanguard of um, the, the capture of Damascus um, in October of, uh, of 1917. So I'm going to move on in the final part to consider um, these a set of extraordinary um, uh, chased uh, vessels. They're associated with this town, Hindia, uh, which is located on uh, the Euphrates River. It's a strategic location because um, north of, of, of Hindia is a barrage, and this was built between 1911 and 1913 by British engineers as part of a water uh, management scheme for um, the Euphrates River. So this area saw a great deal of fighting during the Mesopotamian campaign, particularly at Hilla, um, you know, a little further to the north. And these are the vessels. This is the first of uh, the objects. The inscriptions on this um, have a date, um, and the date uh, equates uh, to uh, the uh, Treaty of Mudros, um, which is in 25 Muharram, 1337. That's the 31st of October, 1918. This particular piece is in the um, Victoria and Albert Museum. It was donated by a Mr. Bing, about whom we know nothing else, um, so there's very little provenance around it. But we can do much more in terms of provenance in relation to the inscriptions. They're in Arabic. Interestingly, they're full of uh, mistakes, um, and that's an important point we'll come back to. But we do know that uh, there's a workshop on uh, Sharia Jissa, um, the Bridge Street in Hindia. So they seem to have been made in this particular town. And you see the Euphrates running through the middle. And then, as you can see in the detail, there are the depictions of British troops, uh, also of, uh, uh, of Iraqis. Um, and some of them are actually talked about as uh, Arab, meaning uh, tribes, you know, so we're, we're perhaps looking at kind of uh, uh, Bedouin as well as uh, settled people. Notice also the, uh, the white flags here. Now, more recent research has actually shown that um, the date on this is probably incorrect. The, uh, 21, uh, uh, the Muharram date is uh, correct, but the year is wrong. It actually dates to 1920. And what we're seeing here is the end of the Iraq revolt, um, which uh, ran from May to October of 20, uh, 1920, um, and just preceded the creation of mandatory Iraq uh, between 1921 and 1924. So I'm going to look at this one uh, that's in the V&A, but I'm going to also compare it with some other objects, um, which were um, clearly from the same workshop. Um, and so just to give you some details, I think one of the extraordinary things is that the amount of uh, representation and observation in here. And this is, I think, a key point because this is unusual, you know, to actually represent something and try and show details of it in a metalwork vessel. 
of this time. I, I don't know of other kind of examples of that practice. Um, and, and yet at the same time, it's made within a kind of very traditional way of chasing into metal a beaten uh, brass uh, uh, tray. So clearly the person who's uh, doing designing it and then cutting it is familiar with the types of uh, boats, uh, the rufa, also, you can see here, which were used to actually cross the Tigris and Euphrates uh, rivers. So there's an observational quality. Notice also that there's identification. So the man who's being uh, executed here is uh, called Sadiq Afendi, um, and uh, he he was uh, tried uh, for um, killing a British officer. Now, just recently, I had the opportunity to see this. This is in a private collection, um, and it's a tray clearly uh, in the same style, actually cut by a different hand. Uh, the actual technique of uh, chasing is just slightly different. And so you can see it's a sort of different person actually um, uh, engraving into the metal. But what we have here is another dated piece. It doesn't have a year, but it, does, it talks about 20 Mohalam. Now, one of the things to notice about this piece is that in this example, the British troops are all on one side of the river and the Iraqis are on the other. Also, the Iraqis, rather than holding white flags, actually have weapons. So we're actually seeing an earlier part of the revolt here. We're actually seeing a sort of documentary uh, evidence of it. Now, this comes back to the inscriptions. Um, now, in, the, in these two objects we're looking at, we have references. I'm sorry, I'm going, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure I'm I'll finish in a moment. Uh, we have references to a, a, a political officer, that's Hatim uh, al-Siyasa, uh, Puli. And this is a man called Harry Pulley. And it's actually the, uh, the family uh, of Harry Pulley own this object today. But he appears in all of them, along with a senior officer who can be identified as Colonel um, Arnold Wilson, who was the second in command to the High Commissioner, Sir Percy Cox. So this is a third object in the same uh, sequence. Um, and again, it's dated, um, this one, to 21 Muharram, and there's a third one which actually is uh, dated to 20 Muharram. And you can see the sort of wealth of detail, this engagement with the modern world, but also with the uncomfortable realities of, uh, of what was happening through this battle. So in, in one of the objects, we actually see a British um, soldier actually pulling a hijab from the, the, the head of a, a Muslim woman. Um, and we, of course, see examples of uh, bombing. This piece is now in the Gulf, um, so I only know it from photographs. But again, when we think about that engagement with the modern world, it is an extraordinary piece in that we see that um, the, the artists who are responsible for this actually were looking at genuine examples of armoured vehicles, um, of armaments that were being used in the conflict. I'm very struck by the fact that the aeroplane is, is, is less, or the biplane is less um, sort of real in that sense, perhaps because you know, it wasn't seen um, at such close proximity. But again, it's this desire to try and engage with the modern world. Now, going back to Harry Pulley, um, I, I'm lucky enough to just have access to his letters um, that he wrote between about 1927 and 1923. And there he actually talks about the need for political officers to become fluent in Arabic. And so the suggestion is that, in fact, actually what we have is something where Harry Pulley himself wrote the inscriptions, hence the, um, the, the mistakes that kind of come through it. And then it was just dutifully in, inscribed in that particular form. If that is the case, it is interesting that the amount of critique which actually comes in of, you know, sort of the activities of uh, British troops. So just to um, finish off, I think that, um, you know, what we see from the evidence of things like the camels, of the objects we've been looking at, is that the engagement with modernity is a very complex one. It doesn't stop you know, uh, established kind of craft practices from going on. But there is intense adaptation. Uh, we see adaptation in the example on the side here because these are um, made by the tinsmith and they're all made out of um, benzene cans. So it became a whole craft to actually hammer out uh, new objects, you know, from this readily available and cheap uh, material. It also reflects the economic realities of the fact that other types of metal were becoming very difficult to uh, procure. <laughs> 
But at the same time, you've got images like this from 1938, where a man is actually working, planishing a, um, a metal vessel using techniques that would have been familiar in the 12th or 13th century. So there are elements of continuity, but at the same time, you know, these sort of profound uh, areas of change. So I, I will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Um, so Aurélie Petiot is a lecturer in the history of art at Université de Paris Nanterre, uh, working primarily on the history of arts and of the arts and crafts movement. After a PhD thesis devoted to Charles Robert Ashby's Pedagogical Tenants in 2014, she is working on a new assessment on the contribution of the members of the arts and crafts movement in British ruled territories from 1860 to 1948. The latter focuses on the study of the movement as a network of cross-cultural influences, collaborations, and resistance. The aim is to determine the changes such a vernacular group implemented and underwent when transposing their ideas and practices in Egypt, Palestine, and Ghana. Aurélie. Thank you very much. And um, thank you very much to Antonia and to the organizers and to the presenters because it's been already a very rich um, day and a half. So this, did I mute myself? Okay. <laughs> this uh, paper aims to assess William Arnold Stewart's contribution to the birth of a distinctive school of modern Egyptian design. And this talk is very much work in progress. So I started right after my PhD 10 years ago, and I've just started again now. I was going to talk about Palestine, and I've recentered it on Egypt and Stuart for several reasons. First, because I got access through Stuart's family, and I would like to thank Nikki and Elizabeth to unpublished archives pertaining to Stuart's time in Egypt. And second, I'd like to stress that as part three of this talk will show, and we've already seen, Craft education in colonial territories under British rule is a highly political topic, as it is continuing to work on Palestinian sources, from which I am not shying away. The war that is currently raging is terrible for both Israeli and Palestinian people, and unfortunately for research it means that sources, papers, examples of work, and contacts with descendants might disappear under the continued bombing of Gaza. This paper is um, part of a book I'm currently writing of modern members of the arts and crafts teaching in Egypt, focusing for the moment on Egypt and Palestine through the figures of Stuart, Ashby, and others. It aims to question the history of transmission, colonial materialities, cultural transfers, um, and acceptance and rejection of this pedagogy. It will also comprise a chapter on their and their students' contribution to the restoration of monuments through the Egyptian Exploration Society. And today I will not mention women training as it's a question Stuart develops further during his time in Palestine, but obviously it is a point of interest. I also won't mention colonial exhibitions of the works product produced in Egypt and their reception, but it's also very much part of this project. This work relies heavily on archives in the Foreign Office, Ashby's journals at King's College, personal archives of the Stuart family. I'd like to thank Mercedes Volley and Dr. Killen, and also the Invisu research, research Lab team, which I am um, a part of. So, sorry, that should have been the first slide. I will uh, go through a short biography of Stuart, then I will present uh, his role as an educator in Egypt, then student productions and part of their careers, and then an assessment of this work. William Arnold Stewart was born in 1882 in Yorkshire. He entered the Bradford Technical School um, aged 15 in 1897 and very early gained employment at Lister & Co, a silk mill, for which he, was, he became head designer in 1905, so very quick career. During his years as a student, he gained numerous prizes for textile design, mentioned in the studio, but also for his paintings and some of his photographs which were accepted by the Royal Photographic Society in 1905. Stuart, a polymath also interested in dress reform and founder of an arts club in Bradford, was elected a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts in 1915 and a member of the Arts Workers Guild in 1929, and rather surprisingly under the title painter. At this point, he had already 
devoted 18 years to teaching and reforming craft education in Egypt, where he arrived in 1911 as principal for the Department of Applied Arts at the Technical School of Cairo, and was about to spend nearly two further decades working in the same fashion in Palestine under his retire until his retirement in 1947. So Stuart's role is relatively understudied and not at all in Egypt. There's a PhD chapter by Dr. Nisa Azhari, who's going to publish her work, um, about his work in Palestine. And Dr. Kilan, who I mentioned, works on his reconstruction of an Egyptian tomb. Stewart clearly shared the ideals of the art and uh, arts movement. He quotes Ruskin and Morris in his creative work of, in Palestine, which is a, a collection of lectures and thoughts um, for his time in Palestine. And his very good friends, um, or even the companion of his, quite unsure, Charles Robert Ashby, who is a more visible figure of the arts and crafts movement. From a letter to Janet Ashby sent from Cairo in 1917, he, it seems that he had visited the Guild of Handicraft in England, and then Ashby and he spent time together in Egypt, where Ashby is an English teacher from 1917. And together they visit technical schools and bazaars, and he will live with Ashby in Palestine, both collaborating on the foundation of the Jerusalem Looms and various other projects. So the quick examples of him referencing Maurice. So, um, the idea that creative work is a delight to uh, the maker, and a quotation by John Ruskin in one of his lectures uh, much later on in, um, in Palestine. So the bulk of Stuart's teaching was done at the Bulak School of Arts and Crafts, formed in 1906 by Sidney Wells, opened in 1909 after the Arts et Métiers de Bulak had closed in 1851. So there's a big gap due to the French presence concentrating more on fine arts. Um, in the teaching of craft from an imperial pre presence. This um, uh, school, the Bulak School, was under the aegis of the Ministry of Agriculture, and there were also um, workshops oops, workshops in Asyut and Mansura, which totaled 743 pupils in 1919. It's, however, quite difficult to assess how many of them were strictly taking arts and crafts classes and not agricultural or engineering classes. We know more about um, Stuart's teaching through Peter Rodek, who was uh, the, on the board of examiners in Cairo and also an architect to the Arab Monuments Committee. Long quote, but important. Mr. Stewart introduced improved handloom weaving and spinning, vegetable and aniline dyeing and machine jacquard, reviving the old Saracenic art of damask weaving and commenced a fairly full course of weaving theory and cloth construction. Previously to, this designs, previously to this, designs were not put onto squared paper in any part of Egypt, and the introduction of the squared paper pattern was therefore an important step in the production of more elaborate and interesting designs. Mr. Stewart also introduced a course of ornamental wrought iron work and sheet metal work, which has so far proved successful and has warranted a further extension during the last year, 1415, when a course of light metal work and jewelry was started. Rodek also st states, that's a studio article, that in 1915 there were 42 students, all male, in the section of arts and crafts, so quite a small cohort. Stuart's view of, that's the building, one of the buildings of the schools of arts and crafts in Abbasia. You have the map, but I will go very quickly. One um, Stuart's view of teaching is evident in the motto he devised for a somewhat naive blason for the University of Egypt. That's part of the material that was photographed by um, Stuart's family. Um, so I don't really know in what context, in which file this was. I'm going to Elizabeth's garage in February to dig more into, into these archives. But the, the blason reads from the old to the new in Latin, and that somewhat points to the concept of invented tradition developed by Obstbaum and others, and I will go back to that. Stuart also teaches at Mike Hamadi's trade school, at least he invigilates an exam, and I still have to work on the Department of Education archives and Egyptian ones to read his reports as inspector. In a letter by Ashby, we know that he traveled through Upper Egypt to visit schools and workshops, so it's not just located in Cairo, it just travels and really tries to have a full assessment of how craft and craft education is taking place. 
There are different methods in um, Stuart's teaching. So Rodak stresses that the individuality of each student is brought out and allowed free expression. So what the arts and crafts movement is trying to do in England or professes to do, but sometimes fails to achieve. An excellent feature of the training is the fact that in almost all the crafts dealt with, designing is not allowed to become a purely academic exercise, but the students are taught to carry out what they design. That's a little quip at the South Kensington system. In the early years in Egypt, Stuart stands against machinery and that will evolve as well. He also teaches by, exper by experiments. So around 1920, he established a small model dye house with an English chemist in charge as demonstrator. So weaving and teaching was much more, it's the basis of his reflection because that's his training, but it's also what he develops more when he goes to Palestine. Um, and he also conducts experiments with local dyes in the Egypt sun, realizing that it takes um, one day to, for the dye to fade, um, compared to like one week, for instance, in England. So he tries to adapt to local conditions. Later on, he uh, seems to evolve his pedagogy and reflects on the oriental way of design, which uh, comes for him from the tool in the 1930s. So he writes, in my fairly exhaustive study of, ori of oriental craftwork, I have repeatedly noticed that design is a logical outcome of the intelligent use of the tool. It has grown out of those forms that come easily from the simple use of tools and is even complicated oriental, in even complete, complicated oriental patterns. We feel that the design has grown out of the process, not from the torturing of the material and process into a design. In this respect, all old work is practically a reverse of the European art school method of teaching design on paper before the process of the craft has been understood. And um, I am to see how he's really putting that into practice. He also strove to organize exhibitions. I won't talk about it today. Um, one important point is that his work in Egypt and Palestine is in constant exchange with both territories. So he's sent by um, the British government as an expert to Palestine while he's in Egypt. He organizes exhibition of Palestine crafts in Egypt and an excursion of Egyptian teachers to Palestine in April 1927, specifically to Jewish schools and in an already difficult political climate. I am reaching part three and the student pro production. And this is um, great because it enables me from the document sent to me by Stuart's family to name some students. And um, as Marcus said, it's quite often uh, difficult to find traces. As a preamble to these images, I would like to um, say that the exercises that were given at the school are characterized by transmediality, already noted by the studio articles on Stuart's own early work in 1903-5, when he himself was a student. And uh, the studio notes that you could see his designs for textile transferred to wallpaper, and they are also noted for notable for their cultural transfers. So from these designs, it seems that the sources put to study were varied from European and British to local Arab sources derived from the observation of mosques and other buildings, objects in museums, and even fragments. So I'll go over some of this case quite quickly. Um, all of this is unpublished material that would be obviously part of a detailed analysis in the book. Here you have designs for chairs um, made by an S. Shiati. And they are in the sort of style Queen, um, Queen Anne revival. And what's really interesting is that Stuart's family still have these chairs. So the question is, were they an exercise of copying design from the chairs that Stuart had brought with him from England? Or were they with these chairs made from Shiati's design? Um, it's also interesting that they are obviously quite um, Western sources, and um, it's quite simple design that was easy to be carried out. Um, for some of these designs, we have the year, the school year, so third year, second year. Um, in this case, I don't know, yet, maybe. Um, another example is this uh, bench. The Arabic inscriptions read Egyptian School of Arts and Crafts, Bench in poplar wood, turning of the traditional Musharabi scale 110 of true size. And uh, so you can see it's a 
obviously local sources. You can see an example of one of these benches um, outside here in Cairo. And you can see also the Turnwood Musharabia technique on this example here. For um, another example of a different source carried out by Ahmed Youssef. Ahmed Youssef is actually quite interested. Um, Dr. Kinn has identified that he was probably um, the person who became chief, chief conservator of the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. So he lived between 1912 and 1999, and he would have attended the School of Arts and Crafts when he was 15. And, um, and so he signed Yosef, and there's another design by him. So that's obviously also a very Western sort of like commode thing. Uh, here is Ahmed Yosef at the museum. And for comparison, here is a, a design by Stuart for a Mrs. Sarouf. <coughs> Again, I will go quite quickly because I have other examples to show. Um, for metal work, it's the same. You have a variety of designs. Here it's by Jindi Arian, who I haven't um, identified yet. But you can see different exercises, a comparison, um, a design by Stuart. There are metal plates and ornaments here, signed by Ismail Farmi. So you can already see that he's teaching a lot of different techniques, different media. What I have more sources of right now is the designs for wallpaper and curtains. They are simplified designs with local elements. Some of them are more stylized in the weft, uh, more Asian style. Um, and what's great with the pictures sent to me by the family is that you can see them in color. There are others that will show you that are published in the studio that are in black and white. Um, here you can see in the central, the top picture, the central element, which looks like a size flower, so a, which points to a Persian decorative style imported to the Ottoman court in the mid 16th century. And it's here overlaid with a, a tulip and set against prunes, blossoms, and floral medallions. Other, an example of the design in um, a French book ornament. Um, other examples also show this idea of symmetry and repetition in the pattern. And others are a bit more naive. So um, these ones are done by Banub Anis, who is a fourth year in 1919. And um, you have, again, like elements of vernacular um, patterns or motifs. I'm trying to go quickly. And here is a, a little more naive design. Um, that shows um, the different phases of training. Rodek insists of, on intermediality, and it's interesting to find similarities, similar tendencies in the designs for painted tiles and plates, and at the same time to know, and I quote, at the same time to note how suitable each group of designs is to the materials in which it is to be executed. And he concludes, undoubtedly, this is due to the happy combination of practical work with abstract designing. Uh, last examples of work is that of facades. These are most certainly um, designs by invention. You can find a certain number of hybrid elements, so marble paneling, what looks like stained glass, um, uh, decorative friezes and religious Arabic inscriptions at the top. These are titled Sketches for an Arab Museum, and this talks about Stuart and Ashby's strong desire to exhibit current design creation and create a craft museums, craft museums both in Egypt and Palestine. But um, as Marcus was um, saying earlier, the Cairo Museums of Arab Art was established before the school um, in Cairo was opened, so it clearly preceded. Pre seeds these designs. So this is quite unclear um, still that whether this is an ex exercise, designs for an ar architectural commission, more designs. 
book designs. And I will turn to two famous um, craftsmen who have trained at the Cairo School of Arts and Crafts. So the first one is Jamal Bertrand, who, is, um, who drew this book cover. Um, and I'm also in touch with his daughter, artist Samira Bertrand. Bertrand um, was born in 1909, died in 1999, and it was a Palestinian student who came to Cairo with his bro brothers, Abdel Razak and Kerry, to um, attend more book covers, uh, to attend the Cairo School of Arts and Crafts when he was 13. Stewart talks about him and he says his training has been much influenced by work in the Arabic Museum in Cairo and by the illuminated manuscripts in the Royal Library, and he had specialized in the crafts of decoration and leather work, at which he is very expert. He later studied at the British Central School of Arts and Crafts for three years from 1934 to 37 under Douglas Cockrell, and he also studied drawing and modeling from life, textile design, block printing, and pottery. And this studying students abroad was a government scheme, and normally the students would come back and owe the government seven years. And so in February, I'm going to uh, also the archives of the Central School of Arts and Crafts and the Camberwell School of Arts and Crafts. Um, Badran became a very proficient, proficient craftsman. He went back to Palestine to restore mosaics at Al-Aqsa and the Dome, of the, Rock, the Dome of the Rock. And he later teaches courses for women in Palestine and became a recognized expert in bookbinding in Syria um, and then for the UNESCO in Libya. And Badran, on top of being an acclaimed craftsman, was also a tireless pedagogue himself. That's an example of pottery by um, his brother, Kerry Badran. And that's a design that's signed by a slightly unreadable name, so I think it's Sadek Al Tabrizi, of a pottery which links um, the teaching at the Cairo School of Arts and Crafts to the rediscovery of pottery in Fustat. Um, but I don't have time to talk about this. Um, a second prominent figure is um, Said Al Sadr, who is a potter, who was also a student of the Arts and Crafts School in Cairo, was also sent to England. And uh, from 1928 to 1930, he went to the Camberwell School of Arts and Crafts, read, and that's really interesting to me, William de Morgan's 1894 report on the feasibility of the manufacture of glazed pottery in Egypt, commissioned by the Egyptian government. He even met de Morgan's family, and according to Alan Carrier Smith, was interested to see that techniques from the Middle East had interested potters in Europe. He had raw materials sent from Egypt to England to search for durable clays that could be fired at a high temperature. So I'm especially interested in these experiments and this back and forth studies of techniques from one place to another, from one time to another, that happens with um, the Johannes and potters in um, Jerusalem, which with Ashby um, or called to Jerusalem to revive pottery, um, and that also fits within the, the narrative of um, invented tradition. Um, he also went uh, to, so in England, um, Sadr met with Bernard Leach in some Ives, who encouraged him to develop his own patterns. And Sadr is widely recognized now as one of the people who revived the pottery tradition in Egypt. An example of his um, attempts to recreate luster glazing when he is at the Campbell School of Arts and Crafts. Let's turn this one. So my last part is about the assessment of this teaching. So can we call about a sort of hybridity? Um, what, what can we make of this contribution by Stuart? In April 1917, Ashby says that Stuart is the right man at Bulak, but regrets that at both Bulak and Fayum technical schools, the work doesn't go far enough. According to him, it's not rooted enough in the workshop structure, still alive in Egypt and at the heart of his own system in England. The school does not select the right kind of people, more dilettants from the higher classes, rather than sons of craftsmen. Ashby praises Stuart going to the slums and actually talking with craftsmen, Arabs, Syrians, Greeks, Copts. Ashby is known for his harsh criticism of the British Whitehall system, which will eventually see him try to be removed from his position in Egypt by the intelligence services. 
yet he was also a part of this colonial system. Stuart concurs with Ashby's analysis. He uh, writes that um, some of the trainees in the higher schools were members of the Fandia who disliked handwork and felt that they had been raised above the workman's standard, and it was beneath their dignity to handle, handle tools. He went on to say, I have long since come to the conclusion that it is useless to train youth of this class as craftsmen. That's in the 1930s. Rodek also credits Stuart. He says, thanks to Mr. Stuart for the beginning of a distinctive school of modern Egyptian design. Have yeah, sorry. Thanks to Mr. Stewart um, for the beginning of a distinct school of modern Egyptian design have emerged and shows every grass promise for the future. It suggests that his products should be sold in Egypt and abroad for the reputation of the school and of Egyptian design to gain recognition. So it's both the colonial uh, trope of educating the taste of the people and the economic purpose within the British Empire, which I won't develop here. And the problem of the assessment of the impact of Stuart's work lies also in the term technical school, which did not strictly apply to craftsmanship, but also to other trades such as plumbers, or plumbing, agricultural trades, etc. So the, the big question is, what, what do we make of Stuart, both as a member of the British Empire, but also as a passionate craftsman and pedagogue? Dr. Nadia Radwan contends that the birth of an effort for craft revival in Egypt grows from 1926, which, with the first independent agricultural and industrial exhibition, followed by 1928 and the creation of the School of Decorative Arts. And I would like to suggest that earlier seeds were planted by the British, who, contrary to the French, granted importance to applied arts. Mostly, um, the French were concentrated on fine arts. Kamal Boulata, who is an expert on Palestinian art, credits Ashby for initiating a process that's, that consequently exerted a lasting effect on the development of Palestinian arts and crafts, and most, most importantly, in contributing to the concoction of a new aesthetic taste that appealed to the affluent elite of Palestine society. So the idea is to ask whether this is the same for Stuart in Egypt, but obviously, um, Stuart, Ashby, uh, all are very embedded in the colonial context. So Stuart writes to Janet Ashby in 1917, saying, There is such a wonderful tradition, and now such decay. And what are we making of it? We may do such splendid things with these people, and we may mar it all. Sometimes I fear that it is what we're doing, putting a stupid modern ideas into a people too sadly receptive of all that is new and pitifully neglectful of what is their own. And with that kind of passage, it really seems to be robbing um, these craftsmen of their agency. So there remains to situate um, Stuart within the colonial frame of the Department of Science and Art and the colonial apparatus within which it was very well inscribed. It seems like many involved in craft revival in the empire posited between the assumption and abdication of his own colonial agency. And that's an expression by Emma Volukau Wanambwa, who worked in Margaret Trowell in um, East Africa. His desire for reform is strong, but falls within what Homi Baba defines as a complex strategy of reform, regulation, and discipline, colonial mimicry, as Baba defined it, was the desire for a reform recognizable other as a subject that is almost the same, but not quite. Stuart embraced the British um, deep belief in craft as unifying, but also in a spot um, of the empire. Um, both Stuart and Ashby rely on the comparison with medieval England, which is very recur recurrent in their text, the guild system, and they both see in Egypt and Palestine a chance to redeem what went wrong with the British Industrial Revolution. They adopt a typical romantic, um, colonial romantic stance, which is shared by many others in India and Africa. As early as 1910, members of the Congress, the Congrès National Égyptien, Nationalist Party, complained that the British had founded the model workshops in Bulak to pull the wool over the Egyptians' eyes. Approaching the scheme to be widely insufficient, two workshops for 1 million Egyptians, are they enough? Yes, for the tyrants, no, for the humans. Each town, whatever its importance, should have its workshop. The author, Walik Rufat, also criticizes the reluctance from the occupation to initiate the poorer classes to intellectual contents 
on the ground that instruction will only make them aware of the social disproportion and render the condition intolerable. And resistance also comes from some of the students. HB students, for instance, seem to be quite aware of the prevalent anti-English discourses. He rep reports his students saying, the Egyptians blame you English for not being genuine in your education policy. You don't really want the people to be educated, so they say, they say you want the show of it merely. So part of the aim of this colonial project is to keep the youth on the land and craft instruction is a tool grounded on a myth of village communities. Stewart shares that opinion. He says nothing could be more pathetic than the conditions so rapidly coming out in Egypt of the half-educated youth of the Fellahin, unable to find situation in the already overcrowded government service, and yet unwilling and unfitted to return to the land and provincial village life. So to conclude very briefly, um, how can we characterize Stuart's pedagogical approach? I think he brings a genuine contribution to the sparring of craft revival after um, the French occupation of Egypt. He is also quite genuine in his relentless work towards teaching and adapting his teaching methods, yet it remains steeped into the colonial context. This is why I also want to pursue research on the students' works and possible testimonies of descendants to assess the degree of adherence and resistance to this particular teaching. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Aurélie. Uh, next, we have Michelle C. Wong. She is a specialist in the Buddhist and Silk Road art of Northwestern China. Her first book, Mandela's in the Making, The Visual Culture of Esoteric Buddhism at Don Huang from 2018, examines Buddhist mandalas of the 8th and 10th centuries at sites in northwestern China. She has also written about art and ritual, miracle tales of animated statues, the transcultural reception of Buddhist motifs, Buddhist materiality, and text and image. Her current book, examine, or her current book project examines the reception of medieval Silk Road sites in the photographs of Marc Aurel Stein. Please welcome Michelle. everyone hear me? Okay. Um, thank you, Antonia, for inviting me to this conference, and thank you to everyone at um, Bar Graduate Center at Queen's University who's made this conference such um, a productive and generative um, event. Um, my paper today traces networks between archaeologists and industrial arts educators in order to examine intersections between Silk Road archaeology and the arts and crafts movement during the Victorian and Edwardian eras. In doing so, I want to shed fresh light on a previously unexplored dimension of the Silk Road expeditions carried out by Mark Oral Stein. And you see him in the center of the slide before you. Stein is known today for leading expeditions into Chinese Central Asia, um, present day Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, and Gansu Province on behalf of the British Museum and the Government of India. He was trained as a scholar of Sanskrit literature and possessed a keen interest in the roots of Indo-Aryan languages. Um, he was equally enmeshed in the arts and crafts circles of his time, first and foremost through John Lockwood Kipling, principal of the Mayo School of Arts and curator of the Lahore Museum. And Kipling was succeeded in both positions by Frederick Henry Andrews, who became a close professional associate and friend of Stein and cataloger of the Stein Collection, which was kept in the British Museum. The first part of my paper, Networks, will trace the connections between these three individuals and the formative ways in which they're shaped in the British colonial context. The second part of my paper, Frameworks, looks at the impact of the arts and crafts movement, um, particularly in British India, that shaped the reception of, Silk Roads, of the Silk Roads and documentation of Silk Road expeditions. Story begins with John Lockwood Kipling, who was the subject of a major special exhibition at the Victorian Albert Museum and Bard Graduate Center in 2017. Um, I'll just skim over his background very quickly. Um, what's important for you to know is that he was trained in ceramics and sculpture and known as an architectural sculptor, um, working on, among other projects, the terracotta decoration of the South Kensington Museum facade. Um, Lockwood signed a three-year contract to teach ceramics and architectural sculpture at um, an industrial school in Bombay, the Sir JJ School of Art and Industry. 
and he and his wife subsequently embarked for India in 1865. This was already after he'd established um, the beginnings of his career um, in England. Um, and during that time, um, he was commissioned by the government of India to carry out studies of Indian craftsmen. And in 1870 and 1872, traveled widely to the Northwest provinces um, and the interior of the Indian subcontinent in order to record the work of Indian craftsmen in drawings that were then displayed at the newly established Indian section of the South Kensington Museum in 1880. In 1884, Lockwood inaugurated the Journal of Indian Art and Industry, which was published until 1917, with the goal of preserving traditional Indian arts and industries and exploring their commercial potential. Let me now say a bit about the role that Kipling played as the founder of the Mayo School of Industrial Arts. Um, and this was the first colonial art school established in the Punjab in the interior of India um, in 1875. He became the first principal of the Mayo School, as well as, as, well as the curator of the Lahore Museum, um, having arrived in Lahore in 1875. Um, prior to that, um, colonial art schools have been established in the major in um, coastal cities, primarily coastal cities, um, Calcutta, Madras, and Bombay. And the goals of the Mayo School were to, by acting as an aesthetic center, school of design, and source of enlightened criticism and advice, um, to um, uh, train the native to become a citizen. Um, and these are loose quotes um, from Kipling. And the language of instruction was English. Kipling developed a curriculum that was not based solely on models um, uh, developed in um, Great Britain. Uh, this was the case at art schools um, previously established in Madras and Calcutta, but rather one that was based on preserving traditional Indian arts and crafts. So among other methods, um, he made plaster casts and photographs of Lahore's museum important collection of Buddhist sculptures. He also emphasized drawing from nature or from objects in the museum's collection um, in his pedagogy so that students could learn skills of visual analysis rather than merely replicate traditional designs and patterns. In his words, quote, it is the object of the Lahore school to revive crafts now forgotten and to discourage as much as possible the crude attempts at reproduction of the worst features of Birmingham and Manchester work now so common among natives, end quote. Students were sent into the old city of Lahore to make architectural sketches, and the school garden was a source of flowers and plants for students to study. Um, photography was introduced as well into the school curriculum as well as woodworking. Um, Kipling undertook private commissions for architectural ornament in order to promote the Punjabi style, um, the local style of decorative wood carving. And we can see one such design on the left in his most important commission um, was the Indian Room or the Durbar Hall for Queen Victoria Osborne, um, which you see on the right. And um, these were um, plaster um, designs and elements in this uh, room were based on designs um, replicated in plaster that in turn were based on um, wood carved um, architectural designs in Lahore. So this was in a sense sort of a transplantation of um, Punjabi aesthetics um, to um, this um, imperial setting. Okay, this brings us to Fred Andrews, um, and he's the fellow on the left um, who was the successor to Kipling at both institutions. And um, he also went through um, a, an arts education. So he um, trained at St. Martin's School of Art, which um, many, many um, decades later became Central St. Martin's. Um, he became acquainted with the younger Kipling, Rudyard, in London. And then shortly thereafter, in 1890, um, he was appointed the vice principal of the Mayo School under Lockwood Kipling, and then succeeded him both as principal of the school as well as curator of the Lahore Museum. And I should also mention that the Lahore Museum was where Lockwood Kipling met Oral Stein. And so kind of through this circle, um, uh, he and Stein, um, that is Andrews and Stein, were introduced by the elder Kipling um, and became friends and colleagues. And according to Andrews' obituary, it was under Andrews' influence that Stein became interested in exploration and archaeology. So here it's worth reminding you once again that Stein was at this point really, um, really known as a linguist, um, a scholar of Indian languages. Um, and um, Andrews assisted Stein as a cataloger of the Central Asian collections and carried out academic research in his own right on Indian art. Andrews held a number of important teaching and administrative positions in Great Britain and in British India. And he traveled between the two, he had quite a peripatetic career. Returned to Great Britain from Lahore, 
Andrews was head of the art department of the People's Palace Whitechapel in 1898. And then from 1906, he was head of the art school at the Battersea Polytechnic. Then from 1909, he was based at the British Museum in order to catalog the finds um, from Oral Stein's expedition, so then known as the Stein, and now um, as the Stein Collection. Uh, returning to India in 1913, Fred Andrews then became principal of a technical institute at Srinagar, and he then uh, resigned this position in 1920 in order to catalog um, the portion of the Stein Collection that was held in New Delhi, and um, it's here in Srinagar that um, this uh, photo, um, photograph of the two was taken. Um, let's see. According to a number of accounts, um, Stein was inspired um, both by the ancient art they saw in visits to the British Museum, um, as well as his visit to the first Arts and Crafts exhibition in 1888. Um, he was also a member of the Arts and Crafts Exhibition Society, as well as the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings. And I'll return to this in the pivotal role that paid in the development of um, professional or scientific archaeology in Great Britain. Um, after Andrews and Stein were introduced by Kipling, um, they um, traveled uh, widely throughout the Indian subcontinent together in order to examine fragments of stone sculpture, uh, with Stein taking on the role of photographing their observations um, and then Stein making notes. And Andrews was also responsible for training Stein in photography and introducing him to the latest cameras and so on and so forth. Andrews did not accompany Stein on, into the field on his expeditions in Chinese Central Asia, but rather he was responsible for cataloging the finds, making preparations for expeditions, as well as serving as a liaison um, for the expedition reports that emerged. So he didn't play a particularly creative role in the design of the expedition reports, but he was responsible, for example, for checking the quality of the photographic plates. Um, and this is um, Stein's an independent catalog of the mural paintings um, from the Silk Roads, uh, mural painting fragments that were collected. And this particular text was published in 1948. Um, but Stein also interviewed in more direct ways. And on the left, you can see um, a seal that was, um, excuse me, that was um, first designed by Fred Andrews um, for um, a, um, a popular travelogue published by Stein in 1904. And this is an image of the goddess Athena. And this in turn was based on a discovery um, that Stein made while excavating um, at an archeological site in present day Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. And he found um, at the site hundreds of letters that were written on wooden tablets um, in Indic language and script. And these letters in turn were sealed with clay. And, um, and one of these seals bore, um, and these, uh, clay seals bore the seal impressions of the letters, uh, uh, centers of the letters, and you can see the seal impression on the right that formed the basis for um, Andrew's um, design on the left. And I'm looking at this, um, particularly through the lens of arts and crafts, I can't help but think of the special interest taken in book plates, book binding, and so forth, the book arts um, in the arts and crafts movement. Um, so that was Stein's cont Andrew's contribution as an artist, as a scholar, Andrews was known particularly for his expertise in Indian art, um, which was openly acknowledged by Stein. And here we can see an article published by Andrews in the Journal of Indian Art and Industry. Um, so this was the journal which um, Lock uh, John Lockwood Kipling was instrumental in developing. And this article was published by Andrews in 1904 on the celebrated Wazir Khan Mosque in Lahore. And this followed up an earlier article, a brief article by Kipling on the same mosque that was published in the journal in 1887. And um, there are a number of things about this article that are noteworthy. Um, first of all, you can see the um, architectural drawing on the right. And here the book plates for the article were based on architectural drawings um, that um, Andrew's own students um, produced. And earlier I mentioned that um, Kipling himself had sent students out to the Old City of Lahore to make drawings and to observe from architecture and from nature. And then another noteworthy element of this publication is that um, Andrew showed a particular interest in pottery decoration and particularly in floral patterns. And he was interested in the distinction between the pottery decoration of the decorated tiles at this site and those from other world traditions. And in fact, he was so um, invested in this that um, he was known to have engaged in um, um, experiments with a colleague um, in order to try to replicate the sort of tile decoration um, that he saw 
Um, and in particular, they were trying to determine whether um, the patterns were um, first painted um, before the tiles were cut or after the tiles were cut. Um, and then actually a third noteworthy element I should say is that um, he was also particularly interested in the mural paintings um, that were extant in the mosque. And earlier I pointed out Andrew's work in cataloging the mural paintings um, from the Silk Roads. Andrew's interest in archival decoration is also evident in a group of uh, Mughal ceramic tiles that he sold to the Victorian Albert Museum in 1923. And um, just, just, just very briefly, um, these were from a ceremonial gateway to a tomb and mosque. Um, and the site itself was dated to the mid 15th century, very likely the tiles themselves were later dating to the early 17th century. And I bring this up again in order to reinforce um, kind of one through line um, in which I, which I see as being the interest in architecture and architectural decoration. And um, I'm interested in exploring how um, um, the interest in Mughal architecture might have informed um, Andrew's own approach to the reception of Silk Road sites as formed through institutions such as the Journal of Indian Art and Industry, um, the Study for the Preservation of Ancient Buildings, and also the Archaeological Survey of India. And the Archaeological Survey of India uh, was um, established in 1861. Um, the first director was Alexander Cunningham, and this was established um, as a government organization for the survey and study of archaeological sites um, on the Indian subcontinent, as well as their conservation. Um, so there's a nexus both of individuals as well as um, colonial institutions um, through which Silk Road archaeology in Chinese Central Asia, not in India, is emerging. Um, it's also worth um, dwelling briefly here on the role played by the Society for the Preservation of Ancient Buildings um, in the development of archaeology in Great Britain. And um, from its establishment in 1877, um, this augmented the earlier place-specific archaeological societies um, that emerged in Great Britain in the 1840s. And the prerogative of the Society for the Preservation, excuse me, Protection of Ancient Buildings was not so much to develop a specific aesthetic or arts and crafts style, but rather was focused on the preservation of ancient buildings um, and the protection from um, um, later alterations or interventions. And it was seen as one of the important archaeological entities um, to emerge in the latter half of the 19th century. Um, and then also going to student training, the kind of training that students received at the Mayo School under Fred Andrews, um, I'm really struck by comparisons we can make between his interest in floral decor, um, the Mughal tiles collected by him and then sold to the V&A on the left, and then the, this um, uh, image of ceramics produced by Fred Andrews students on the right. And here we can see how these continuous scroll-like floral patterns have been adapted here to Western shapes, um, to plates and vases and bowls. And um, I like this comparison um, between the Mughal tile on the left and the William Morris tile on the right because um, I think I'm trying to imagine how someone who uh, maybe from a very early formative period in his artistic career uh, was shaped by the ideals of William Morris and then went to India and was maybe you know seeing Indian monuments and architectural decoration through that lens. And here we can see um, in both sets of tiles, uh, a continued interest um, in floral decoration, but here we can see how the um, bold symmetry of the Morse design on the right is offset by the asymmetry of the Mughal tiles um, on the left. Okay, and next I move on to frameworks, and this brings us to Oral Stein. Um, I mentioned earlier Oral Stein, who was known primarily um, really as a linguist, so he had learned Greek, Latin, French, English while still in his teens. Um, he was Hungarian by birth, um, British by citizenship in 1904. Um, he completed advanced studies at the universities of uh, Vienna, Leipzig, and Tübingen. And at the University of Tübingen, he received his PhD in Indology in Old Iranian or Persian in 1883. Um, and then the following year, he went to England where he pursued advanced studies in quote unquote Oriental or Indian languages and in archaeology at Oxford and at the British Museum. Um, he also studied map making during military service in Hungary. And um, uh, after going to India in 1887, um, and he went to India um, for an administrative post. Um, so he became the registrar of the University of the Punjab, and the pre following year he became principal of Oriental College of Lahore until 1899. So he was not an arts and crafts administrator, but nevertheless his positions at these institutions um, provided him with um, 
um, a setting for, with which to gain, first of all, um, greater familiarity with the general region, and then also um, a starting point for archaeological expeditions um, into Chinese Central Asia. Um, the city of Hikotan, um, you can see um, um, highlighted by the blue arrow on the left, and um, the red lines are very simple schematic outline of the Silk Roads, as they skirt the, the Tathmakan Desert, and to the upper right, um, not marked on the map, is the Lop Deserts. And these were one of the areas of focus of um, Oral Stein's three Central Asian expeditions um, carried out between 1900 and 1916. His fourth Central Asian expedition in 1930 was aborted due to um, issues with his passport. And um, a point that I want to make here, which is really, really important, is that um, I'm using the term China Central Asia um, to underscore the fact that as someone who was brought up through the British colonial system, British colonial institutions, um, he was actually carrying out archaeological excavations and expeditions into an area that was not under the jurisdiction of Great Britain, but rather under the last imperial dynasty in China, the Qing dynasty. And then the map on the right, you can see the Punjab, where he was based in British India, highlighted in white. And so basically, he traveled northward, more or less northward, um, through the Pyramid Mountains and then crossed overland into um, Xinjiang, which you see blown up in the map on the left. And the city of Khotan was a frequent starting off point um, for his expeditions to the Takamakan and Lop Deserts. This was a convenient place to regroup, get supplies, and also oftentimes local people would bring um, um, old things that they found in the desert to him. As Stein explained in the introduction to his first expedition report titled ancient Khotan, um, and this was published in 1907, it was actually a discovery of um, the so-called Bauer manuscript, and here you see one folio from this manuscript, and this was discovered, um, interred under a Buddhist monument in the um, city of Kucha, um, also located in Xinjiang, Uyghur, Tanis, Major in 1891, but it was the discovery of the so-called Bauer manuscript um, that first turned his interest toward Xinjiang as a site for archaeological exploration. And his interest really was in searching for Sanskrit manuscripts. As I mentioned previously, he was deeply invested in learning about the um, geographic roots of Indo-Aryan languages um, um, into which, under which um, Sanskrit um, falls. Um, but in addition to the interest in manuscripts, nevertheless, the sort of objects that would fall under the category, what we, we would consider to be category of arts and crafts, such as potteries, textiles, metalworks, and terracotta reliefs, received equal attention. And here, I think it's really important to note the framework that he and Andrews, that the framework he and Andrews brought to Central Asia was formed in British India. And this is a uh, point that I'll return to again. So in this expedition report, Ancient Khotan, Stein cited Andrews' wide knowledge of ancient Indian art and his own high artistic abilities um, that were qualifications to assist Stein in the arrangement, description, illustration of my collection, sorry, his collection of antiquities. And this is a loose um, quote. Okay. And here we can see um, one plate, one of the color plates from ancient Khotan, um, published in 1907. And this was the expedition report from his first Central Asian expedition. And here we can see illustrated stucco plaques, and these form decorative elements of larger Buddhist statues, for example, um, in the halos of Buddhist statues. And, um, and um, these were um, scientifically analyzed by Arthur Church, who is a professor of chemistry at the Royal Academy of Arts. He conducted scientific analyses on a chemical composition. Um, so he was really interested in the um, ratio of mineral to water um, in order to ensure that the, um, they were really interested in the drying times for plaster, um, concluding essentially that they were plaster of Paris and that this was the same method, quote, as is now done in making plaster casts, end quote. And um, so it's really interesting to think of, quote, unquote, plaster, both in light of um, a method of, of copying, of training um, under, the arts and under arts and crafts pedagogy, as well as an original object um, illustrated here in an, in, in an archaeological um, report. Um, so here I'm not arguing that Silk Road archaeology led to the making of actual crafts, but rather that um, British arts and crafts served as an aesthetic benchmark and framework through which to interpret and document Silk Road finds and that the questions, some of, or at least some of the questions being asked in the material emerged from arts and crafts concerns. Um, earlier, I've mentioned um, Kipling's interest in local wood carving techniques um, in the interior of India and the Punjab. And um, that was also part of the Mayo School's curriculum. 
And Stein's own writing about wooden carving um, in ancient Khotan, the archaeological report that I mentioned earlier, um, dwelled on the decorative motifs. Um, so he, um, like Andrews, was deeply interested in floral motifs, and he made comparisons between those floral motifs to those that were known from Buddhist sculptures. He described carved wooden architectural brackets of the sort that you see on the left as, quote, fine specimens of ancient architectural wood carving, end quote, noting the longevity of this floral motif um, through to modern boat carvings um, in Kashmir and on the Indus. And I'm struck by comparisons that we can make between the archaeological interest in ancient wood carving that we see on the left and the contemporary, um, for Stein's time, the contemporary interest in wood carving as an arts and crafts discipline, as you can see on the right. And this is um, an image of students at the wood carving workshop at the Mayo School. And these photographs were taken just one year apart. In Stein's archaeological reports, I'm struck by the range of language that he used to identify excavated objects. Um, I won't read them all, but you can see them here. And um, this is something I'm thinking about further. And um, the fact that he's using um, a variety of language um, to refer to essentially the same types of objects. And I suspect if I were to think about this further, I would find more confusion, you know, blurriness between categories than more clarity. Um, here it's also productive to reflect on the impact that the British Egyptologist Flinders Petrie had on Oral Stein. Um, I'll skip over his background, but I want to just draw attention to these two books, um, important um, publications by Petrie, Arts and Crafts of Ancient Egypt, published in 1909, and Decorative Patterns of the Ancient World, published in 1930. And um, these two publications um, clearly foreground arts and crafts in Petrie's approach to um, Egyptian antiquities. However, even prior to these two publications, Flint, um, Petrie's authoritative and highly influential 1904 publication titled Methods and Aims in Archaeology instructed approaches that would not have seemed out of place in the arts and crafts curriculum. For example, uh, a chapter on copying, chapter six, prescribed the use of plaster casts and drawing. He wrote that plaster casts could be useful as reference, and he elaborated, as did Arthur Church of the Royal Academy of Arts, um, on the proper ratio of water to plaster. Again, the concern was that the plaster not dry out too quickly before you could take a proper cast. Although he was an advocate of photographic documentation, he argued that drawing could be useful for rendering fine details that would otherwise be lost under the uniform lighting that was used um, to, to make photographs. So with Petrie's very detailed instructions in mind, it's clear to see how someone in lieu of any formal training in archaeology who was simultaneously schooled or steeped in British arts and crafts, namely Fred Andrews, would have possessed training that could have transferred quite seamlessly to archaeological documentation. If we take a look at the table of contents of the arts and crafts of ancient Egypt, the categories also align neatly with the sorts of media that were emphasized in British arts and crafts. For example, clothing, plaster and stucco, stone woodworking and metals would have all have been quite at home at the first arts and crafts exhibition in 1888. Um, I, shall mention, I shall also mention that this book was um, published in series titled The Arts and Crafts um, of the Nations. So clearly there was a comparative um, element at work here. Um, it's striking that Petrie's book makes no explicit mention of arts and crafts, or arts and industries. Instead, he emphasizes the history of Egyptian art. So he uses the word art consistently in each historical period and his interest in distinctive characteristics of Egyptian art that emerged from the land. Um, scholars have previously noticed that under Kipling and others, a distinctive form of British arts and crafts e emerged in British India. So what I want to think about now is the place that Central Asia had in arts and crafts thinking. Um, and um, Stein adopted a very particular term to describe Chinese Central Asia, and this was Serindia. Um, it was a compound word derived of series, um, referring to China, um, and then India. So, um, and it's a word that kind of perfectly encapsulate his in-between, kind of the in-between quality of Central Asia, um, an uh, area that was known for um, Greek influences, um, an Indo-European presence, um, Indian influences, as well as Chinese influences. And so this name really gestures toward the liminal quality of this region. Um, in light of this, um, I find it intriguing that in Fred Andrews' um, very critical review of, of Petrie's Decorative Patterns of the Ancient World, um, he criticizes that um, the lack of coverage of Chinese decorative art. Here, I'm, I'm actually not sure whether Andrews was thinking of um, Chinese, the interior of China, or of Chinese Central Asia, but um, I, I, I'm really curious about, just given all the time that he spent in India and Kelly in the Stein Collection, whether he was or was not thinking, in fact, of, of Central Asian decorative arts, or whether he considered them to be Chinese decorative arts. 
Um, and um, Appraisal um, demonstrates that um, Andrew's um, criticism was correct. Um, so Owen's 1868 gram of ornament reveals only a total of 10 pages devoted to Indian Hindu, which referred not only to South Asia, but Southeast Asia and Chinese ornament, with no material at all from Central Asia. I'm going to close very quickly with this image and um, interested again with kind of um, how Stein was looking to Egypt and Egyptology as a standard for um, scientific excavation and also to um, the state of preservation um, of relics of a civilization long extinct. And I just want to raise a question that I can't myself answer about the role of extinct civilizations um, in arts and crafts discourse. And with that, I'll end. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to um, know um, when you were, if you had looked also at the development of the Bitsalo school that was first initiated by Schatz. The idea was in 1903, and then the first um, uh, like establishment of the school, and it was called Palestine then? Yes. Was in 19, is 1917, and I was just curious if, you, if what was, there was something going on between those. So I'm not looking at it too much because it's been quite well studied, and also because the British are focusing on the Arab population their education and craft to establish a sort of balance between the Jewish population and the Arabic population. The early incarnation of the B'Tselel school was a lot involving Arab Jews from, from all the Arab countries with the metalsmithing expertise. So I thought that was kind of like an interesting phenomena that was happening. And a lot of the European people trained in arts and crafts were sort of, um, uh, I don't, it's, it's hard to use like a, a, a bad word, but um, I mean, they were, it was like they're, the first incarnation, the makers yeah. were the Arab Jews. Yes. So um, anyway, so it's just kind so, of interesting, and there were people from Egypt. I admit that was part of the metal system. So at Ashby and uh, Stewart's writings, they do make a, a big distinction between Arab Jews and Palest um, Arab Muslims, and they have this idea of a sort of typical Muslim art that is very different from what the same uh, the Arab Jews are doing in the region. So it's. It's a bit complex politically because they want the British want to use craft as a way of creating civic citizens, and that's, civic is a word that recurs quite a lot in Ashby's um, writings, and to have everyone live together in peace, but they establish differences and often with quite racist categories. So the Arabs are lazy and the Jews are quite good, but not very inventive, for instance, that's um, in Ashby's writings. So I, I need to, to go more in depth in the specificities of who is doing what and who is taking um, inspiration for whom. But thank you for your question. Okay, any other questions? Um, thank you, all three. And, and Michelle, I was really glad in, in that sort of final slide that, or close to final slide that, um, you had this kind of Fred Andrews sort of ironic nod to Owen Jones and the grammar of ornament. And I was just wondering, kind of across all, all three talks, to what extent is the, you know, these really lovely case studies of how ornament and designs and, and craft techniques get appropriated, remixed, um, translated in various ways, to what extent were these actors that you're studying um, engaging with that particular history and that kind of document, Owen Jones. Again, not to not to sort of reinscribe him as a, a kind of grandfather of, of this discourse or these techniques, but I'm just curious, you know, historically, were they aware of that, you know, effort? Were they engaging with it? Were they critiquing it? Um, just, you know, curious how, how that might bubble up as a kind of ghost behind um, your, your studies. Yes. <laughs> so we have 
two actors working at the same time. So Fred Andrews, the artist and the industrial educator and administrator, and, and then Oral Stein. So Andrews clearly was familiar with this. And, and I think that he was enmeshed in a really more circle, but then he's someone for whom I imagine this was impactful and then, then left for India. So, so I don't know to what extent he was aware of developments in Great Britain after that. I mean, well, I guess he was, he was going back and forth as well, but, um, but also I think he was looking at this, all of this kind of through a very particular lens, um, you know, as an arts administrator, not even really as a, you know, teacher so much as an, or an active artist, but as, a, as an administrator. Um, Oral Stein, I don't know to what extent he was aware of Owen Jones. He was um, very supportive of Fred, uh, of Fred Andrews' career, um, and he understood the importance of um, the industrial arts. So this comes to um, the forefront in their um, correspondence. But um, I think just kind of maybe in responding to this, this question that we've been asking, like where's William Morris, or, and now you know where's Owen Jones? I think this was definitely there. Um. Yeah, to take it from a different perspective, I mean, thinking about, um, I've, I've wondered about the extent to which, you know, scholars and artists in the Middle East were aware of writings, you know, published writings that were going on in Europe. And in the Kamus Sosana at the Shami, I, I mean, I don't, I haven't found a single reference to a, a, a non-Arab sort of publication. Um, now, it's not to say that they weren't interested in it, because we, one of the authors ran a s sort of literary salon, um, which was uh, you know, much, much attended. And, and the thing is, I think one of the things that there's just the sort of early research going on about is, um, is journals that were being produced in uh, the Arab-speaking world in the late 19th, early 20th century, where they were often translating uh, technical uh, pieces, you know, from you know, European scientific journals. So I, I think that there is, you know, some of that is coming in, but the extent to which it's actually informing the work of actual artisans, I, I don't see that. And I, and I think it's probably, you know, more through things like the, the schools that are being established that have been talked about that, you know, you'd actually see that kind of practical um, transmission. I don't know yet. <laughs> so I'm hoping that when I go to the, the personal archives of Stuart, I can find books that would have formed part of his library or that his granddaughters could tell me what if they have inherited some of the books to have a better idea. But I expect he was aware of Owen Jones, Grammar of the Ornament. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Um, I have a question for Professor Milbright on the um, series, the commemorative series. So because the question of design came up across the three talks and um, because you also mentioned that different hands were at play that you could observe different techniques, I wondered if you could speak about um, how you thought the design was transferred onto the um, metal trays. If there was, you know, like paper intermediary, for example, because it's sort of, there's this idea that there wasn't any design on paper in the Islamic world. And then the other question that I had, which is related to workshop practice, um, perhaps division of labor, is um, if you've found any uh, other multiples of each of the platters, or if you've only found one of each, and if so, do you think that the series itself is a unicum, or do you think that it was um, produced in multiple form? Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so, so I've there's very good ethnographic evidence from uh, Damascus workshops in the 1970s where um, a master would typically um, draw in ink um, on the surface of the vessel that's going to be chased um, and then the apprentices would uh, put that in and I think that's probably what's going on here and that would account for the the, the different uh, depth of chasing that you see between uh, some of the vessels so when you look at them really closely you can see that they must have been done by different people uh, but the thing is that I mean that relies on um, sort of pattern books and there, there are a few surviving you know pattern books uh, you know from the 19th century and so on suggesting that you know workshops had motifs uh, and and then an awareness of how to kind of fit them into spaces and I think you know you can see that in some of the Mamluk revival 
uh, where. But with, with compositions this complicated, I mean, there aren't pattern books to help with that, particularly as they're trying to show new things. Um, so it, it does seem to me that they must have drawn them out, you know, in, in some detail, you know, before actually putting them in. Probably the kind of repeat motifs and other things that cover the surface could be improvised, but, you know, the actual linear design, um, I, I think they must have been drawn, which then again brings up the question of who drew who drew them, you know, were these things where you know, a, a patron is sort of saying, well, I want this depicted, and then it's it, then the, the master of the workshop is, is trying to work that out, or, or are they being given actual drawings of something else to work from? And, and I don't know the answer to that yet, but I think it's, it's certainly well worth you know, pursuing. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back for our sixth and final session. <laughs> Thank you, Ivan. Um, in this session, this session is entitled The Aims of Art, uh, which takes its name from an essay and a book by William Morris. And according to Morris, the aims of art are to provide happiness, activity, hope, and freedom. Uh, and in this session, we'll hear two papers about different case studies relating to the appropriation of arts and crafts ideas and rhetoric for political purposes by different groups. Um, with that, I will allow Daria to introduce our speakers and please welcome. Hello everyone. Dr. Joseph McBren was educated and has worked in Ireland, Scotland, and France. He holds a PhD in art history from the National College of Art and Design, Dublin. He teaches at Belfast School of Art. He has written widely on the visual and material culture of the Celtic revival, the Irish arts and crafts movement, and national romanticism, modernism, and design reform in Ireland and contemporary Irish craft. More recently, he has published on the intersecting global histories of gender, sexuality, and disability in modern craft. He is currently completing a biography of the Irish artist and designer, Evie Hone. Please welcome Joseph McBrin. Uh, and thank you, Daria, for that very kind introduction. Um, yes, I'd just like to say thank you to Antonia for inviting me to participate in this symposium. Um, and to the board, its students and its staff for making me feel very uh, welcome. Um, so it's been great to be here and I've, I've, I've been made to think a lot. Um, so to begin, I'd like to dedicate this paper to Nicola gordon Bow. So exactly 100 years ago, um, on this day, the 15th of December, 1923, the Irish playwright and poet W.B. Yeats delivered a speech uh, entitled The Irish Dramatic Movement to the Swedish Academy in Stockholm to mark his acceptance of the Nobel Prize in Literature for that year. Anyone listening would have thought the Irish revival was an emphatically non-visual affair in which modern Irish culture emerged from a sacred spring of songs and stories taken down in the 19th century from Old Gaelic, which reconnected the imagination and speech of the country with a long forgotten poetical tradition. This is uh, typical of Yeats, um, a later in life revision of an earlier story. In a series of articles published around about 1900, under the same title, The Irish Dramatic uh, Movement, Yeats lamented the loss of a distinctly visual culture in Ireland, as like literature, it had been cut off from common life, and, there was an, and it was no longer rooted in the soil. He added, and I quote, in England, men like William Morris, seeing about them passions so long separated from the perfect, um, that it seemed as if they could not be changed until society had changed. So they tried to unite the arts once more to life by trying to unite them to use. They advised painters to paint fewer pictures on canvas uh, and to try to burn more on plates. And they tried to persuade sculptors 
that a candlestick might be as beautiful as a statue, um, end of quote. So here we can see in this slide W.B. Yeats in his Dublin home at Marion Square in round about 1923. Um, as you can see, he's reading an edition of the works of Geoffrey Chaucer, published in 1896 by um, Morris's Camscott Press. Um, Yeats's copy of the Camscott Chaucer had, had been presented to him by Lady Gregory um, to mark his 40th birthday in 1905. The assimilation of poetry, print, and visual imagery in the volume's decorative yet austere simplicity haunted Yeats for years. He called it the most beautiful of all printed books. In the first volume of his autobiography, autobiographical uh, writings, uh, published in 1922 under the title The Trembling of the Veil, Yeats called Morris his chief of men and wrote, if some angel offered me the choice, I would choose to live his life, um, poetry and all, rather than my own or any other man's. Although Yeats admired Morris's reinvention of modern England as a sort of medieval dream world, um, he disagreed with Morris's scepticism about the possibility of a national art, and Morris's belief in an art that was, in, in Yeats's word, words, tribeless, nationless, a blossom gathered in no man's land. Yet Morris's wider ideas prevailed in, in his thoughts, and even by 1927, Yeats could write to May, uh, Morris's daughter, to say that Morris was still his chief of men, even though by that, that period, um, in the 1920s, England had provoked his antagonism um, in the aftermath of the brutal suppression of the Irish Revolution of 1916, where an armed insurrection in Dublin was crushed by the British Army. The leaders who signed a handmade proclamation claiming Irish independence from British rule, um, and they included an artist, William, uh, William Pierce, a poet, Joseph Plunkett, uh, an educator, Patrick Pierce, and a prominent trade unionist and socialist, James Connolly, men who had all read and been inspired by William uh, Morris. Um, they were imprisoned uh, after the insurrection um, and they were executed by, by uh, firing squad. So it was a moment that Yeats says in a poem written in 1916, but not published until this time in the 1920s when he won the Nobel Prize. It was a moment that galvanized Irish nationalism in which a terrible beauty was born as aspirations for independence were certainly valid. Um, but um, such aspirations, if they led to um, a violent insurrection, would ultimately lead uh, the country down the path to partition the separation of the country into two separate states um, and uh, a, a century of bloody violence and, in, um, and innocent deaths would ensue. So William Morris casts a long shadow in the life and work of W.B. Yeats and offers a critical point of departure for any discussion of the legacy of the arts and crafts movement, especially in in Ireland. The two men had first met in Dublin in April 1886 when Morris came to lecture on the subject of socialism at the Dublin branch of the Socialist League. His speech on the aims of art um, talked about craft and revolution, about um, the future um, of society um, and being dependent on, on a full um, a sort of change, uh, a full revolution. This was later published in 1887 um, in the Socialist League newspaper, The Common Wheel. Um, Yeats seems to have been deeply impressed by, by Morris at this critical um, initial contact, but wrote prophetically and typically the following year that, though I think socialism good work, I am not sure that it's my work. So Yeats's break with socialism did not necessitate a break with Morris or his ideas. In fact, Yeats is generally credited with direct involvement in the setting up of the key arts and crafts worksh workshops in Ireland um, after the turn of the 20th century along strict Morrisian lines. Uh, Dunimer, which produced handmade textiles and hand-printed books, um, with his sister Lily running the embroidery department. She had worked in London under May Morris at Morris & Co. And their other sister, Elizabeth, who ran the printing press at uh, Dunimer, she had worked briefly at Morris's Council Press. Uh, Morris would be advisor to um, 
Daniemer from uh, 1905 until he died in the 1930s. Um, the other workshop um, that he was involved in is Anturglina, which is a Gaelic expression for mythology like Daniemer is. Um, and Anturglina means the Tower of Glass, and it was a, a stained glass cooperative set up in Dublin in 1903 by Sarah Purser, on which Yeats advised. So many English artists, designers, and architects associated with the arts and crafts uh, movement, especially the first wave in the 1870s and 1880s, either directly or indirectly, came to work in Ireland. William Burgess uh, worked on Cork Cathedral, E.W. Godwin on a castle in Limerick, Sel Selwyn Image made stained glass windows for the Celtic revival on Presario, Edward Martin's home in Galway, Charles Voisey built the improbably um, named house called Dallas for the Texan-born wife of a Belfast linen merchant. <laughs> Um, and it is one of his uh, best houses. Um, and Charles Ashby sent one of his best assistants to run a country workshop in the depths of rural Fermanagh. So um, William Morris had come to Ireland himself in October 1877, before his conversion to socialism, to remodel an interior um, in a neo-Gothic castle for the Earl of Shoreville in Tullamore in County Offaly. Um, he thought Dublin dirty, uh, and writing to Georgiana Byrne-Jones, he observed that the villages we passed on the way to Tullamore, which was in the Midlands, he said, they were very poor, poor looking, and the courier's houses in outside appearance are the poorest habitations I have ever seen. And he made note of the palpable British militarised presence centred in the Curra in, Cal in County Kildare, where he wrote, our army of occupation sits. Evidence of the extreme poverty and social distress faced in parts of Ireland, which had largely been untouched by the Industrial uh, Revolution outside the Northeast, could propel even those on the fringes of the arts and crafts circles in London, or completely from outside them, into action. Alice Hart, the sister of a celebrated Victorian uh, philanthropist, Henrietta Barnett, who was co-founder of Tornby Hall in London's East End, took up the mantle of cultural philanthropy after reading reports in the English press of a famine in County Donegal um, on Ireland's remote Atlantic coast. Hart launched uh, the Donegal Industrial Fund in December 1883, producing hand-embroidered textiles in, Do in Donegal that were then ma made into uh, sellable goods from furnishing fabrics to fashion and marketed to aristocratic and middle-class consumers in London. Here we can see a very rare surviving example. In fact, I think it might be the only example of the fun so-called Kells embroidery. It's made of brightly colored threads uh, in cotton on plain unbleached uh, um, Irish linen, which is sometimes known as Galway flannel. Um, and it takes its distinctive design of interlocking abstract and zoomorphic patterns from the celebrated Book of Kells, the, the 8th century illuminated um, manuscript which was held in the museum in Dublin's Trinity College. The Book of Kells had been stored there for safety, tells you something about the political instability of Ireland over many years, um, since 1654. Um, but it was in the early to mid 19th century that several major archaeological um, Discoveries were made, um, such as the Cross of Kong, the Tower Brooch, and the Arda, Cha the Arda Chalice, that seemed to corroborate the design of the Book of Kells as ostensibly a national style. Um, so a style that predated um, uh, colonization. Whilst at once part of this 1880s generation, W.B. Yeats was key in establishing the presence of arts and crafts ideas in Ireland, but he was also set apart from his, his um, um, English contemporaries in recognizing that in Ireland, the strength of a new culture depended on a native vernacular, whether it be language, music, or material culture. English arts and crafts architects and designers tended to import English arts and crafts ideas and aesthetics quite literally um, in their work, in their um, Irish projects. Uh, most, aside from Morris and later Walter Crane, said almost nothing about the political context or the relationships between or the relationship between the two um, uh, countries. So debates about a distinctly Irish national style would parallel those heightened moments for, for struggle for political independence. 
So the Home Rule movement of the 1880s and 1890s, the revolutionary period of 1916, the partition of the island, which was accompanied then by a war of independence and a brutal civil war in the early 1920s, and even the period of bloody violence in the north, which ran from 1969 to 1998, generally known by the euphemism the Troubles. Um, when the Earl of Mayo founded uh, the, Arts and Crafts, the Arts and Crafts Society of Ireland in April 1894, he did so after Morris's example. You know, he says in the uh, the original um, circular that was written in 1894 that his desire was to make the workman less of a machine um, um, and so on. And he apparently consulted uh, William Morris in person about the constitution of such an Irish or, um, organization. Yet as it evolved, emerging um, from the, seven society, uh, the, the society's seven major exhibitions, which were held between 1895 and 1925, um, there was a tension between English arts and crafts models, which were being imported, and this search for a national style. While Celtic design could, uh, we could take on a sort of exoticism or otherness uh, in the British marketplace, as in Hart's Donegal Industrial Fund, um, by the 1920s, by the moment of partition, it was established um, in the new independent state of the South. Um, the island was split into two in 1921. 26 counties became known as the South, the Free State or ERA, and the remaining six um, constituted what became Northern Ireland. So they became two independent states with two governments. Um, in opposition. So Celtic design continued to exist in the north, but it did not become the official style. In the south it did. So take for example this uh, silver presentation casket, which was made in 1924 by the jeweller, the Dublin jeweller, uh, Mia Cranwell. The casket was commissioned by the writer Alice Stopford Green, who was an English historian of Irish affairs, um, as a receptacle for the parchment roll which contained the signatures of all the members of the new house of the first Irish Senate. So that was the first Irish Parliament which convened on the island for over 200 years. Um, and it was, it, was, it was charged with setting up a government for the newly independent 26 counties. So the casket was symbolic. Its shape was, uh, and its design are derived from a traditional Irish architectural form typified by the 9th century oratory of Jurelius in County Kerry, um, which is the most complete example of early Christian architecture in Ireland. It has quite an extraordinary narrative on it of this winged figure. Um, which symbolizes the age of materialism and colonialism. So uh, unfortunately, I don't have time to go into it, but it is, it is quite um, e extraordinary. It's in the Royal Irish Academy, and if you go onto their website, they have lots of details about it. So Cronwell was one of the many Irish craft workers, one of the many uh, brilliant um, Irish makers, that in her own lifetime was compared to William Morris. Um, so one newspaper report in, from 1922 opined, like William Morris, Miss Cronwell wanted to bring the things of beauty, the finer arts, into everyday life as in the past. But on a visit to Cronwell's Dublin workshop, the poet Ella Young suggested that as she made this, in her mind as she worked, Mia Cronwell had a thought of the 16 men executed in 1916 for the part they bore in the Irish Revolution. So there, there you have a sense of the tensions between how these things um, are, are received. So I'd like to look a little more closely at the concept of legacy, this, this concept where we are, we're, we're talking about really, is it more legacy or, or transmission or transformation of English arts and crafts ideas um, in, in this, um, this context of the materialization of a distinctly Irish visual culture? But, and I want to look, you know, for the next few slides, at those decades of decolonize, decolonization which immediately follow partition in 1921. I want to take the example of the craft of stained glass, which was one of the key successes of the English arts and crafts movement and championed by Morris himself. And it was transformed in Ireland, a country without a single example of surviving indigenous medieval glass. Every stained glass window in the country had been smashed in the Reformation. Um, they took it as the cornerstone of, an, of the national style. It becomes so important. Um, also, it should be pointed out, Ireland had no 
uh, native glass production. All the glass was going to be imported for all this work. It's, it is an extraordinary story. Um, but it becomes now, I think in the Irish psyche, it's almost like poetry. Irish people have a particular affection for stained glass. Um, uh, there was something also to be said about our scholarship on on um, uh, so Irish history of art scholarship, where painting is in some ways maybe seen as analogous to kind of cultures outside the island, and stained glass became something that it was very close to painting, but could be parlayed into being maybe something that was much more um, national. So. A distinctly Irish style may have satisfied public and official taste in, um, with regards to what was produced um, in stained glass in this new country of the, uh, of the south um, of Ireland, but it would mask political as well as personal psychosexual tensions that would bring artists into conflict with the new state. Um, and I want to look also, after I look at kind of these ideas of, of really complex tensions to do with individual and collective memory, I want to look just quickly at the idea of when this type of craft of stained glass was then imported back to England, because I don't think they expected that. Um, and then I want to look at how it played out in terms of um, our, um, Ireland's contribution to international modernism. So at the Arts and Crafts Society of Ireland's sixth exhibition in 1921, the Dublin artist Harry Clark showed an astonishing 22 works from the monumental to the, um, the miniature, including this small stained glass panel. It's quite bizarre that I put it up so big. It is 13 inches by seven inches. It is a tiny thing. It's less than a, um, a page. You know, it is really small. Um, it illustrates the Song of the Mad Prince, a poem from Walter de la Mer's 1913 collection, Peak cock pie. Um, it's a poem inspired by Shakespeare's Hamlet. Here we can see the prince in the center and in the background and profile we can see his mother and his father um, uh, and we can see the shining city of Elsinore um, in the very back as well. You know there was a, um, a sort of tension in the composition really centered on the aestheticization of the male body this this um, idea of you know offering it up for contemplation and consumption and and Hamlet's mournful expression is is quite extraordinary and and something that Clark would specialize in these these hypnotic eyes are are, are really breathtaking um and this almost floating uh, poisoned dagger uh, in the shape of a crucifix um, that Hamlet would use to kill his stepfather, Claudius. So its design, oddly, is a curious mix of Irish and English sources, from a, um, a, um, Elizabethan miniatures to the brightly coloured and ge geometrically complex so-called carpet pages of Irish illuminated manuscripts. Um, reviewing the exhibition in the English magazine The Studio, um, the Irish art critic Thomas Bodkin compared Clark's work directly to the Book of Kells, commenting that although Clark's activities are turned into different channels, he made stained glass, he did book illustration and so on, the impulse which animates them, uh, Bodkin says, is essentially the same as that which moved his faraway precursors. And he quite emphatically ignores the English sources for this, which is what makes Clark such a rich and interesting artist. So on the surface of it, Clark may have shared the Yeatsian idea of a national folk memory rooted in the soil, uh, but here is something undeniably Freudian in his interpretation of dreams, um, dr as, as dreams is somehow a mask for the unconscious, whether collective or individual. So the underlying psychosexual tensions that we, we uh, find in Clark's work would bring him into con conflict with the new government in the 1920s free state when they commissioned a window illustrating the work of Irish writers um, as a present um, to give to the League of Nations um, who were building this new building, the International Labour Office in Geneva, and all the member states would give a gift of, a, of an artwork. Um, when Clark made this window, um, he was advised uh, by W.B. Yeats, and it's now in the Wolfstonian Museum in Miami, and it's, it's uh, something everybody should see. Um, so, so the window was rejected by the government because it contained um, obscene images, and these complex kind of um, strategies within Clark's work and the psychological uh, meanings were not singular, they were also in the work of his contemporaries. Um, particularly in the work of his northern Irish contemporary, Wilhelmina Geddes. So Geddes, like Clark, worked in stained glass um, and book illustration, um, 
And while Clark drew on a whole range of sources, she was much more singular in looking to specific traditions of Irish sculpture. Getty's interest in sculpture was nurtured by her older contemporary, um, the sculptor Rosamund Prager uh, from the north. And we can see her here in 1914. I thought this might be interesting to see just for the historical context, because she's working on the facade decorations of the Thomas Andrews Memorial Hall. Um, Andrews was, of course, a naval architect from Belfast who was responsible for building the Titanic and died upon it in April um, 1912. Um, so the social kind of context for the arts and crafts movement in Ireland is, is really quite interesting because here we have arts and crafts artists working for the shipbuilding community. You know, there, there was patronage, there was money in the north. Um, and what they wanted was um, sculpture for some reason. So anyway... Uh, Rosamund Prager was the daughter of a Dutch textile merchant and was a key figure in the Irish arts and crafts movement. She pioneered the use of Irish subjects. It was very, very particular um, uh, using Irish mythology, pointing to the particular type of authentic sources. She was com committed to craft processes, traditional hand carving, um, and worked principally in Irish stone, wood, or clay. Geddes, this younger artist, would in turn... Um, um, uh, to translate many of the sculptural ideas that come from this, this studio into stained glass, such as monumental and simplified forms, shallow picture space and wet folded drapery would become lead motifs. And she would very often, like Rosamund Prager, draw very distinctly on Irish precedents. So here we can see two windows that Geddes made, not for churches in Ireland, but for churches in England. Um, in the early 1930s, on the left, we can see St. Francis and his Canticles of All Created Things, um, a window at North Chapel in uh, Sussex. Um, and on the right, we can see Joseph of Arimathea at um, Otterton in Kent. So the reason I'm showing you these windows is the idea that uh, Geddes goes to work in England in 1925, and she remains there for the rest of her career. And at that point, she's really considered peerless amongst her stained glass contemporaries in England, because it runs out of steam as an art form in, in England. Um, however, uh, although she worked in London for some 30 years and produced, um, um, without question, some 17 masterpieces, um, and she showed at the London exhibitions of the Arts and Crafts Exhibition Society, as well as the Arts and Crafts Society of Ireland's Dublin shows, she remains completely unacknowledged in a British context. She's quite well known in Ireland, but a majority of the work is in England, which is all very quizzical. Um, here's a detail just to give you a sense of the quality of the work. They've got, they've got a screen, a grill behind the window, which is a bit unfortunate, but it's a tiny little detail of the St. Francis window um, at North Chapel. So um, a similar sense of erasure befalls Getty's only pupil, the artist Evie Hone. So when Evie Hone began making stained glass in the early 1930s, she was already a successful painter, hugely successful painter, who had been central to developments of avant-garde abstraction in Paris after the First World War. Um, uh, so remarkably, in 1939, after the government had rejected Harry Clark's uh, window for Geneva, they commissioned Evie Home to make one for New York, to go to the New York World's Fair. And what she does is she makes um, a, a, a window that encompasses symbols of the four different areas of the Irish, uh, of the island, right? So it's Irish symbols. Um, each region, north, south, gets included. She controversially includes the north, and it's at a moment in the late 1930s where a new constitution is drawn where the government makes a territorial claim on the north. So she kind of sort of visualizes that in stained glass. So I've decided not to show you that because I could talk about it forever um, and show you this one. Um, this was commissioned in 1952, and it's one of the very last windows that she made. It's an extraordinary window in Donegal. It was commissioned by James Johnson Sweeney, who by 1952, too, was director of the Guggenheim Museum here in New York. Um, uh, and this rose window is for a little country church in a, in a little town in County Donegal called Ardra, uh, where um, Sweeney's grandfather had been born. Daniel Sweeney um, had been a local school teacher, um, and James Johnson Sweeney wanted some type of memorial which would be about education. So the window is um, it depicts Christ among the doctors. The two main panels, the one at the top shows um, David with his harp, and the one at the bottom shows uh, Moses carrying the two tablets of the Decalogues. Um, so the other panels of the four evangelists, and at the center, um, you have this, this image of the Christ child. Um, so Sweeney um, himself um, uh, suggested that the, the, 
the symbols were devised in discussion uh, between him and home. Um, but she suggested that they, the whole window should be designed in the tradition, uh, or sorry, the traditional manner of an Irish stone cross. Sweeney later wrote, um, after she died, that uh, this was the spirit that fused a fervent admiration for the medieval arts of Ireland and an enthusiasm for that exploration of contemporary European art today that made the work of Evie Hone uh, vital, uh, sorry, a vital embodiment of both. So the window was completed and installed in 1953. So to bring this kind of short overview to a conclusion, um, Harry Clark dies suddenly in 1931 from tuberculosis, exacerbated by a relentless workload. Wilhelmina Geddes and Evie Hone both die within months of each other in 1955, um, also in part from the exhaustion of years of unremitting work. Whilst these individuals shaped and defined debates about arts and crafts in the post-colonial Irish context, the legacy of the arts and crafts movement was surprisingly to be appropriated by two, the two emerging post-partition governments. In the North, participation in what was called the Festival of Britain in 1951 cynically aimed to reposition the northeast of Ireland as a province within the wider remit of British national identity and employed craft as a key symbol. Here we can see on the left the cover of the catalogue that accompanied the, um, the state-funded exhibition in the north, which was exactly the same. It was identically you know, the same as the other publications for um, analogous exhibitions in Scotland, Wales, and England, and featured the same distinctive festival logo uh, designed by Abram Games. In the south of Ireland, which became a republic in 1949, it cut all ties with the United Kingdom. And uh, before that, uh, between 1921 and 49, it had to remain within the Commonwealth. Um, a newly formed Arts Council and Irish Export Board invited a group of distinguished Scandinavian designers and educators, who we can see here on the right, to come to Ireland and prepare a report on craft and design in 1951. The controversial design in Ireland report was not published until February 1962 because I don't think the government you know, wanted people to read it. It was so damning. Um, and its severe criticisms of the poorness of Irish design um, led in turn to the founding of the Kilkenny Design Workshops in 1963, which was a state-run craft, craft consultancy, which is believed to be the first such uh, practice set up by a government in a Western country. The successful linking of traditional indigenous craft practice to national industrial development, of course, emerges from um, arts and crafts debates. But it, within the context of the Kilkenny Design Workshops, um, uh, it earned them an international reputation. And by the 1980s, the organization had undertaken consultancy training in several countries who were seeking similar frameworks um, to build modern design cultures based on a national, based on national craft traditions in post-colonial contexts, including the Philippines and Sri Lanka in Asia, Barbados in the Caribbean, and uh, Lesotho in South Africa. So, uh, really to end, um, I started this paper with a poem by W.B. Yeats, and I want to end with, with a poem by another Irish Nobel Prize uh, winning poet, Seamus Heaney. Um, here we can see, I'll just leave you with this slide, here we can see the Dutch potter, uh, Sonja Lonsveer. So Sonja Lonsveer um, is, is, is um, offered a job at the Kilkenny Design Workshops to, to teach pottery um, and to develop um, um, a pottery uh, workshop and she comes to Ireland in 1965 and stays and becomes one of the most distinguished Irish craft makers um, <clears throat> of recent years. At the Kilkenny Design Workshop she is charged with reinventing modern Irish ceramics using her distinctive batik method um, a Dutch appropriation of an Indonesian textile applied to ceramics that she pioneered in the Netherlands. Um, so it adds a further layer to this idea of the post-colonial paradox. Nothing's ever a straight line in these conversations. Um, and it certainly kind of adds a certain kind of complexity to uh, sort of the very binary readings of Irish um, um, craft. So um, in writing for the 2011 retrospective of, of Londres work, which took place um, in Carlo, uh, the great Irish craft historian uh, Nicola Gordon Bow uh, turned to a poem in, in search of a sort of um, Yeatsy 
an idea of craft being rooted in the soil, she turns to a poem by, by Seamus Heaney that he had written for, for Sonia Londvier some years before. And in this poem, Heaney writes, um, and if glazes, as you say, bring down the sun, your potter's wheel is bringing up the earth. Thank you. Next, Professor Conal McCarthy is director of the Museum and Heritage Studies Program at the Stout Research Centre, Te Haranga Waka, Victoria University of Wellington, Aotearoa, New Zealand. He has published widely on museum history, theory, and practice, including the books Exhibiting Maori, published in 2007, Museums in Maori, published in 2011, and Museum Practice, published in 2015. In 2017, Konal was one of the authors of Collecting, Ordering, Governing, Anthropology Museums and Government, published by Duke University Press, and in 2019, Curatopia, Museums and the Future of Research, published by Manchester University Press. And in 2021, was one of the authors of a major study documenting the Dominion Museum ethnological expeditions of 1919 to 1923. Please welcome Konal. Uh, kia ora. <clears throat> Thank you, Dara, uh, and everyone for making me really welcome at this conference. It's great to be here in person and not on a screen in the middle of the night, as is often the case with uh, New Zealanders joining international conferences. Uh, I think there's going to be lots of resonances and echoes in what I'm talking about today to uh, what Joseph has talked about and others have talked about here, so hopefully you'll find something interesting. Uh, the expedition that Dara referred to can be seen here on the screen. This is a photograph taken in 1923 on the East Coast. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the craft, the object you can see in the centre of the picture, uh, and the people standing alongside it in order to connect the craft to the politics, which is going to be the major theme of what I'm talking about today, the way in which what became known as Māori Arts and Crafts became a tool uh, in developing and advancing tribal social uh, ends. So on the left, we see Apere Nangata, a lawyer and politician who was uh, described as a homegrown anthropologist. On the right, Tarangihiro, Peter Buck, who was a medical doctor and politician and later became a well-known anthropologist of the Pacific, the director of the Bishop Museum in Honolulu and a visiting professor at Yale. The panel they're working on, on the front lawn of Ngata's house at Waiomatateni on the east coast, is called a tukutuku panel. And when Ngata was building his bungalow in an arts and crafts style, just to the right of this picture in 1913, he became concerned about the loss of local cultural practices and skills uh, in Māori decorative arts. And this is what began this journey towards the establishment of the School of Arts and Crafts many years later. When completed, the tukutuku panel or latticework panel would look something like this. And that particular zigzag pattern is known as potama, which is often described as a stairway to heaven or knowledge or enlightenment, some kind of notion of ascent or progress. And you can see that it sits in between carved panels or popo and rafter, painted rafter kofaifai, uh, made usually by a woman in a tribal setting, as we can see here in the 1930s in the Dominion Museum. Uh, creating this overall effect inside a carved meeting house or whare whakairo, effectively uh, the body of an ancestor. So what you're looking at is the ancestor's backbone, uh, the ribs uh, and the heart. So very much a statement of identity and belonging. This is the meeting house at my university, Te Hiringa Waka. It's The name means the hitching post of canoes. So it's very much about uh, relationships, uh, identity, and belonging. But in many cases, what we understand, or what the public understand, is the traditional or customary whare nui carved meeting house from the 20th century is something that's perhaps a product or was invented in part through Ngata's engagement with the arts and crafts movement in the early 20th century. This is not my area in particular. A lot of people have worked on this subject. Uh, Roger Nietzsche 
Anne Calhoun, Damien Skinner, and this book you can see here on the left, uh, Linda Tyler, uh, and, and others. In the late 19th century, the Pākehā, or European appreciation of Māori visual culture, rose from an estimation of something that was primitive and barbaric to something that approached Western art. It was variously described as, han as handiwork, uh, craft work. And here in Augustus Hamilton's book, published between 1896 and 1901, it came to... Uh, adopt the status almost of, of art. The, the title here is Māori Art. You can see that core cool fi panel running down the front cover of the book. The subtitle, however, was the, uh, the, 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 the handicraft of the Māori race. So it had a slightly ambiguous status, I guess, during this period. Inside the book, uh, Hamilton, who's really a naturalist who collected butterflies, as well as what he called, increasingly, Māori art, uh, gathered together a whole lot of samples um, of uh, various kinds of decorative arts, such, such as these rafter patterns or kōwhaiwhai. And when he became director of the Colonial and later Dominion Museum in 1903 in Wellington, uh, he employed a lot of these decorative elements, such as here in the book plate for the museum, and set out to collect as much as possible as he could uh, of Māori carving, which increasingly was referred to as uh, Māori art in the so-called Māori Hall of the Dominion Museum, which later became the National Museum and today is known as Te Papa. Uh, Māori art was also seen as being the source for a lot of arts and crafts products produced by Pākehā artists, men and women, who got involved in carving and weaving and various other things. So we can see that wakatoa in the centre of the picture there, that wakanu, and the rawa, or the strakes along the side of the canoe, were carved by a Pākehā man. So here we can see the interior of a house around about the same period. All these products are made by Pākehā craftspeople. So the arts and crafts movement then in New Zealand took many forms. Uh, there were a lot of people who were interested in architecture, in ceramics, in various kinds of objects. But I'm not going to focus today so much on that Pākehā production. I'm going to focus more on the way that Māori engaged with this movement and steered it towards their own tribal ends. In 1906, there was a large exhibition in the city of Christchurch in the South Island, inspired by the St. Louis exhibition that we've heard about at this seminar, 1904. And here, as well as a British gallery of arts and crafts, this village was set up, intended by the organisers like Augustus Hamilton and other amateur ethnologists as a vision of what they called Māori land. So that was a little bit like the Celtic twilight. It was this kind of romantic, idealised Māori past, which was often used as a source of symbols and vocabulary for various kinds of writing and art in the early 20th century. However, even though this looks a little bit like the, the, the living villages, the human zoos um, of anthropology and ethnology at this period, the evidence suggests that these people who lived in the village and demonstrated arts and crafts and did performances effectively took over the pa, the village, and ran it according to their own uh, tikanga, their own practices. So what started out as a kind of a vision of Māori land a model pa, a model village, became a living village in a sense. And it's interesting to see what happened with the craftspeople, the carvers like Neki Kapua and his son seen here, who carved this wahurua. They were often commissioned by people like Augustus Hamilton in the museum to create works that were strictly traditional, appealing to museum models perhaps, or to some kind of notion of customary static fixed art from the past. In most cases, what artists and performers did was ignore that advice and do their own thing, and often create interesting synthetic works that mixed Western styles and materials with their own traditions. An interesting person involved in this exhibition was Mag Maggie Papakura, uh, that you can see on the left there, Makaretsi. 
And she uh, was um, someone who was quite entrepreneurial. She, inspired by the Christchurch exhibition, she organized an exhibition of her own with arts and crafts and performers and went to Sydney and Melbourne to various exhibitions and then to London where she organized to have a waka or a war canoe uh, paddled at the Henley Regatta, uh, took part in the Empire Exhibition, and so on and so forth. So we see then Māori during this period using museums, exhibitions, anthropology, ethnology, fieldwork, archives, and so on, uh, as tools to advance their own causes. So by the 1920s, uh, the term Māori arts and crafts had become um, normalised and there was an increasing appreciation amongst the general public of Māori arts and crafts and an argument made by Māori politicians like Ngata for state funding to support these practices in order partly to create a national style of decorative arts and architecture, partly to provide income for communities, partly, at the beginning anyway, to produce items for sale uh, in the tourism trade at places like Rusrua. Here we see the cover of a book by an English artist and teacher, William Page Rowe, which was published um, by Nutter uh, under the auspices of an organisation which I'll talk about in a moment. And there on the right, you can see his forward, where he champions that this foreign expert has recognised that Māori visual culture aspires to the status of art with a capital A. The book is a really interesting analysis of various forms of art, including tāmoko, body art, carving, whakairo, weaving, raranga, and so on and so forth, including the kinds of experiments with three-dimensional naturalism, so sort of Western styles of, of art, which artists like um, Tini Waititi and Neke Kapua were experimenting with. So this particular image here, a very famous image, has been described by Nick Thomas uh, as uh, aspiring to being the Gauguin of the South Pacific. However, when I uh, first wrote about Māori Arts and Crafts in the chapter that uh, Antonia uh, has on her reading list, I wasn't really aware of the way in which this particular movement was connected with a wider context of political and social development. And this became clear to me later on when I did further research into the other activities that Ngata in particular was involved with, um, so that the program in arts and crafts was related to programs in education and housing and land development and farming and so on and so forth. So here we have a really interesting volume, uh, again, uh, published by Ngata, uh, by Felix Kiesing, called The Changing Māori. The focus here is not so much on a static art from the past, but the notion of cultural adaptation, which is borrowed in part from Boaz's ideas about a kind of a malleable, changing culture concept. So um, rather than the art being fixed and unchanging then, uh, I think at this period we see a presentation of arts as being dynamic and living. It's a little bit like what we've heard about today with um, the relationship to modernity, paradoxically, is that heritage and heritage arts look old, but they're new. There's something uh, in the present that has recourse to the past, that draws on images and symbols from the past, but does it in a way to advance contemporary causes, often in, in the domain of politics. An image from this book showing you the arts of weaving, which were perhaps not so much championed in the arts and crafts movement, perhaps because carving was more akin to sort of Western sculpture and received more attention, much to the annoyance of uh, female artists, I think. But here we can see in this image and the caption, this emphasis on uh, mixing uh, art forms that are syncretic, that borrow materials uh, and styles from other areas, and that are changing and growing and adapting. Notice, too, uh, on both books, that little symbol there on the front cover showing you the particular publisher. So now I'm going to sort of connect this work in the arts and crafts to the wider political program uh, that Ngata was involved with. In 1922, inside Parliament buildings, the Native Affairs Committee Room was decorated in the style of Māori arts and crafts, again with an emphasis on whakairo, carving, tukutuku, uh, and so on. 
Uh, and this was a kind of a statement, I guess, of a house, as you can see from the facade down the end of the room, inside the house. Uh, at the front, on the right, we can see two Māori MPs, and Ngata can be seen down the end of the table, second from the right. At around about this time, um, Ngata was involved very much in uh, church building, as well as house building, as I'll explain in a moment. Uh, when he became concerned about the declining craft skills, uh, he gathered together a lot of carvers and weavers from his area, uh, Ngāti Paro on the east coast, and this memorial to Māori soldiers who died in World War I was constructed in, in 1926. And again, we can see that blend of Christian, uh, Anglican ideas and Māori architecture and spirituality. So the mantle under which a lot of this work was done was a thing called the Board of Māori Ethnological Research. And here you can see Ngata uh, with um, a letterhead from that period, established in 1923. Uh, in 1924, the Māori Purposes Fund Board was established, the Māori Board of Arts and Crafts in 1926. Uh, Ngata got into power. This is all done when he was in opposition. Uh, when he got uh, into power in 1927, he became Minister of Native Affairs and transformed the Department of Native Affairs into a body which tried to enact a lot of his ideas and policies. So we can see the ways in which arts and crafts fitted this wider political program. If you look closely at that little uh, brand there, it's, it, the, the red image is, is of a seagoing waka haudua, uh, a voyaging waka, and underneath that the words Utaina. And here in one of the board's magazines, the secretary of the board explains the meaning of that symbol and the kinds of things that they're trying to collect, preserve, not salvage so much as maintain and revitalize. So an attitude towards perhaps museum collecting ethnology field work that was similar to but slightly different uh, from their peers. The Māori translation of the board is Te Puare Whakapapa, which means the Whakapapa board, Whakapapa meaning genealogies, uh, relationships. And at the end of the first paragraph there, you can see them describing the kinds of things that they are loading on board the canoe in order to preserve. This um, stuff that the utaina means to load on board, I guess sort of to, to salvage, to save, to preserve. So that, that sentence reads, Ka utaina te te waka o te puari nei ki ngā taonga anu iritiana, all of these treasures loaded on board the canoe, treasures, taonga, something handed down from the ancestors, such as ki ngā kōrera ngā tangata matau, to the speech of learned men, ki ngā whakapapa, genealogies, ki ngā karakia, prayers, incantations, ki ngā waiata, songs, ki te mune huki and money, ki a tai ai o, o akorero te whakapukapuka hei titiro mati ao katoa, to make it possible to publish, to disseminate these treasures so that all the world may see. So, Act of Parliament 1926, the School of Māori Arts and Crafts is set up, uh, funded through various means, uh, mostly government money, uh, established initially in Rotorua, but travels around the country, and despite its original preamble, effectively it was directed to create new carved meeting houses for communities around the country. And over the next 30 years or so, 25 carved meeting houses were built and decorated by the School of Arts and Crafts for various tribes around Aotearoa. Here you can see the carvers and the weavers working in the Dominion Museum in Wellington. So they often used museum collections as models for recreating and experimenting with uh, carving and weaving and other arts. Uh, in the background there, just behind the men, you can see a, a, an older man seated with women around him. That's Jacob Heberley, who was the Māori carver who was employed by the museum. He was also involved in collecting and other kinds of curatorial activities. And in the background, the woman from Ngāti Rokoa doing the tukutuku panels. 
Here is Nutter involved in another exhibition, 1940, very much involved in exhibitions of various kinds. And on the left, a group called Ngati Porniki, a performing arts group, um, performing around a piano uh, in the rebuilt Tahoki Turanga. So the carvings from the East Coast, from the Rongofakata tribe uh, that were collected in the 1860s uh, and set up in the new Dominion Museum in 1936. So as well as working alongside archives and museums and collecting and sort of government-funded uh, research, Ngata was very busy in the community with his own networks. Uh, here is the opening of one of those tribal meeting houses, Ngāti Raukaua, uh, up the coast from uh, Wellington. And it's interesting that the openings of these exhibition uh, of these houses were very much accompanied by uh, research and revival of performing arts, um, speech making song, uh, and various other cultural practices, all directed at what Ngata referred to often as race uplift. So here we have uh, Ngata telling his friend Buck by letter, he's at the Bishop Museum by this stage, what the purpose um, of these, this house building was and what it meant for the people. And it ties in again to what we've been talking about in this particular session about identity and politics. Ko whiwhi rātou i te taonga he afitanga mai rātou ngākau, he whakahoki mai te wairu o rātou tipuna, he putahi mo te whakāro o ngā tei tamariki i roto i te ao Pākehā. So there you have a fairly clear statement of the kind of political ends of arts and crafts. 1940 was the centennial of the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi, uh, first signed in 1840 between Māori chiefs and the Crown. And at Waitangi in the Bay of Islands, February the 6th every year, uh, we have Waitangi Day, the so-called National Day. The Treaty House stands on the grounds, and what Ngata did through the 1930s, and here opening in 1940, was to construct a wharanui called Te Tiriti o Waitangi, the Treaty of Waitangi, based on museum models as a statement of bicultural nationhood. So alongside the Treaty House was this Māori house that reminded uh, the treaty partners of their responsibilities under the treaty, and there leading the haka in front is uh, an elderly Aipirana Ngata. And there's some references. Kia ora. Well, I, I wanted to thank both of the speakers. They were great, um, especially at the end of two days. Uh, very stimulating. But I, I just, the last one, um, that's um, Kona. Yeah, I it's just so exciting. Um, I just was like uh, wondering what, I know it's hard to answer it, but what was the legacy of all this work? Well, like, I, I, what happened after? Um, the, the immediate legacy, by the mid-1930s, Ngata had to resign. There was a, a commission of inquiry into his activities, particularly in land development. And I think what happened was that he got a bit too big for his boots and had too much power, and he was sort of taken down in this commission of inquiry, and he resigned from some of his political positions. But as a result of that, he became more involved in arts and crafts, uh, dictionary work, the Bible, and various other kinds of cultural activities. Um, but I think you can see that legacy going into the post-war period. Uh, in various kinds of, you know, performing arts and visual arts and various things. And I, as I hope I suggested in that first section, in a way, the, you know, the, the traditional Māori meeting house, as many people understand it today, uh, in many ways is one of the products of this engagement with arts and crafts. So something, you know, something modern, something reinvented, not something old. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I have a question for you too, Connell. Um, as you know, I've been very interested in the um, uh, cross-Pacific flows of influence between the South Pacific and the North Pacific coast. Um, and you, you mentioned um, uh, Keizing, I think, you know, influenced by Boaz to think about culture. But I'm, I'm, I'm wondering about... Um, over the course of the two days, we've talked about contexts in which, say, Morris and arts and crafts were directly influential in other places, and other contexts in which it wasn't about invoking that legacy. 
And I'd like to ask you about what potential, were there potential models that the main organizers of this movement were looking towards? I don't mean kind of academic, intellectual, theoretical models. I mean, models of craft revival. Were there, were there any prototypes for them to draw on and to apply to the specific Maori work that they were doing? Um, I, one of the things that triggered this question in my mind was when you said, um, Gata uh, described this as race uplift in the 20s. I can't help think about the Harlem Renaissance and the language of African American, you know, uh, cultural what was framed as a renaissance we've talked a lot about renaissance stuff in, in the past but um yeah what were they were, how much how much was this a uh, totally autochthonous <laughs> movement and how much uh was there sort of awareness and influence thanks aaron um i don't think it was entirely autochthonous i think uh a lot of these leaders were very cosmopolitan and well read and they knew what was going on. I haven't seen many direct references in the Māori literature to Morris and Arts and Crafts, but I have seen references to things happening in North America. And you've mentioned Keesing, and of course Keesing comes to the US, he does a PhD with Whistler, and then he goes to the Pacific Islands and he does something about Samoa. Um, so there, will, there are definitely those links across the Pacific, I think, and later on, particularly strong with Canada. Um, the Antiquities Act 1902, I think the model for that was something in Egypt. Um, so they were looking around for models, but, and um, you mentioned something just the other day, there's possibly a connection with Canada that we haven't, we need to sort of follow up a little bit. Someone from the group of seven, right? Yeah, Arthur Lisma. Arthur Lisma, okay. So there probably are those connections there, and I, I haven't, yeah, I haven't followed them up. So that's something for the next seminar, Aaron. <laughs> Um, I'm just curious how much um, white craftspeople appropriated Maori symbols. And um, I was taken aback when I was the curator at the Wolfsonian and wandering through <clears throat> the 150,000 objects there. <laughs> there was a there was a um, a little silver casket with Maori figures in each of the four corners and it was a uh, silversmith in Wellington I forgot the name and I, I didn't know um, is that was that typical is that unusual Be in the same way that um, at the turn of the century uh, you know Rookwood had these idealized images of Native Americans as did Rook uh, as did Tiffany and I'm just curious about that analogy between countries. Yeah, I think it was quite common for Pākehā artists to make things in a Māori style, uh, both men and women. Um, and it was, in a way, I think it was part of that kind of Māori land, kind of Celtic twilight type, sort of romantic, idealised sort of s stock of images and motifs and styles that people use. So that, that was quite common, I think. And in many cases, I think, as with the Māori land discourse, a lot of Māori artists and politicians and, and tribal leaders colluded with and contested that stuff at the same time. So sometimes they challenged it and sometimes they went along with it because they could see that it provided leverage for their steering resources and government money towards their own tribal ends. So it was a kind of a strategic kind of engagement with it. Um, so today, a lot of people find that quite uncomfortable. Um, the, the, for example, there were savage clubs, and savage clubs were a sort of a membership of gentlemen who would dress up in Māori clothing and have hui or meetings and give speeches and be rangatira and stuff like that. So it was kind of a, a form of settler self-fashioning in a way, which today seems really kooky. Uh, but at the time, it was you know, kind of normal. It's just, it's fascinating. Thank you. Okay. Um, so Joseph, hi. Um, so I was struck when you were speaking about uh, Sonia Landwehr. Yeah. 
Did I hear it correctly? You yes, said she right. applied a, a batik yeah. technique to ceramics, but I was wondering if you could describe that a little bit, the technique and how it looked. Cause... It, it was quite crude. It was literally like a decorative um, pattern on top of uh, functional wear. So it was vessels. Um, and it was literally taken from the textile process, you know, so she used the same process. So she used cuts? Um, I think so. As far as it, well, I don't know how she managed it, but it was a similar, <laughs> similar so, process. So it had a crackle or glaze? It, was it a glaze? I don't know. It must have been, yeah, it must have been a glaze, mustn't it? Yeah. She didn't do it for very long, so there's not very many of them surviving. Um, but yeah. That, but that was the, yeah, there is. I mean, I, I can send you some information. And um, sadly, she died. Sorry, I'm all about death, aren't I? She died recently, and they sold her studio. So if you go online, um, there was a sale, and they sold everything. They sold her wheel, her pottery wheel. They sold all the early work. Um, but it, it was quite limited. I don't think the market in Ireland really, there isn't a market for ceramics. People don't buy ceramics. And... I don't think the batik ceramics particularly, you know, fell well. You know, no one really thought they were particularly good. It just, it is. I mean, it's, it strikes me as so, so it strikes me, you know, every time I hear it, you know. Um, but certainly I can send you some information. That's no problem. But thank you for your question. Hey, uh, I also have a question for you, Joseph. Um, you know, I having just literally a week ago seen the Geneva window at the Wolfsonian, which has been reinstalled in a nicely wow. sort of contextualized uh, display yeah. while the permanent collection is being, you know, renovated. Um, uh, uh, you, you started where you kind of focused on this Yeatsian idea about the, the folk kind of consciousness really rooted in soil. Yeah. And to me, that seems, an, let me phrase that as a question rather than a comment. Um, what do you make of the sort of tension between the fact that many of these makers and this kind of network is really a largely cosmopolitan kind of urban, uh, uh, somewhat Anglo-Protestant in, you know, character. Yeah. yeah and then this, this sort of, so, you know, blood and soil kind of idea. And you know, I, I, I couldn't help but think of somebody like Paul Henry, a painter who's traveling to the West of Ireland and depicting these places, but then exhibiting in London and, and so on. And, you know, I, I just was, would love to hear your thoughts a little bit more about that tension between where the actual kind of soil is and then the... <laughs> and whose soil. Whose soil. Who and... gets to say, you know. Uh, no, it's a very good point, and it's a really good question. Thank you. Um, yes, I deliberately chose pictures that I thought would sort of engage, and I was looking for... I suppose there's other narratives in that of the anonymous maker and there's been so many brilliant books about craft in Ireland about brick making and artisanal culture in 19th century Cork and so on um that it's that there are choices so I, I obviously chose not not to to go down that that road but you're right I mean it did look like a lot of sort of white Anglo-Saxon Protestants didn't it <laughs> but I think there was I mean I'm not I think I am slightly more cynical than Paul Snerton if he's here today <laughs> uh, if he, maybe he's not here now but I, I think I'm more cynical and I find it quite hard to to believe there was that innocence that they thought they would, you know, reinvent language, reinvent visual culture. But I think there was something in it. I think there was a real faith. I think 1916 in Ireland changes things. I think the death of those men really changes it. Countess Markovitz, the one woman in the insurrection, of course, is she is spared because she's a woman. She gets life imprisonment. Um, so it's, it's a complex history, you're right. Um, and it's a particular... Um, take that I presented and the one thing that I think was interesting to see then was the textile made by the anonymous person in Donegal because uh, to my knowledge no one's ever found those textiles they were all brought to England they were all sold they're in collections that are not you know they're not attributed to the workshop so no museum in Ireland has that you know uh, that in a collection there's no access to those things so those anonymous makers are those stories are are lost which is terrible so i was really thrilled when i found that textile it's in a collection in england so strangely yeah thank you thank you um from the cynical to the hopeful um i just want to um get back to you aaron's question about models for craft revival and it seems to me that um when we're looking at these different craft revivals through the world, the Irish case is particularly important for a lot of other craft revival movements because that was the first crack in empire. 
Um, so I've, I have case studies where um, Indian commentators, Nanda Kumar Swami, for instance, are explicitly pointing out that the Irish nationalist art movement and uh, the anti-colonial movement there is something to look at for uh, models for what to do and why we're doing it, uh, not just how to revive craft, but the purpose of it as well. Um, so I kind of wanted to turn that back on itself and ask you, beyond connections to Morris with the Yates sisters, et cetera, were there any other influences or kind of models that they're looking at? Yes. <laughs> I think there's lots of ways to go at that question. Thank you. It's a really great question. Yeah, there's lots of ways to answer it. I think the European context is quite important. So there's lots of looking in, in Ireland to Hungary, to Poland, to Finland, particularly countries that begin with the invention you know, of a national language or the rediscovery of a language. So I think there's lots of really um, interconnectedness between those countries. Um, Political treaties, first of all, you know, the case of Poland, that type of thing. We get a lot of that, you know, um, and not so much artistic exchange. Countess Margaret, of course, this 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 Irish aristocrat marries a, marries a Polish count. So there are instances of direct connection. Um, but there's there's various ways to kind of consider it. Sorry, I'm losing the thread. <laughs> what were you what was the question again? OK. Yeah, I mean, my, my my looking at the Irish context is, was Morris that central? I mean, it is if you look at the Yeats family, and that is the narrative that I have to go with, because that's what, you know, scholarship is telling us. But when when you look at it, how central was he? And, and I think Yeats discards so much and is quite, um, quite unpleasant about Morris until he's quite old in the 1920s, until he's, you know, in his 40s and 50s, and then he's quite nice. But I think for a long period, he thought Morris... I think the break comes in 1916, where I think in Ireland is this desire to to realise there has to be a revolution, there has to be a rebellion and a complete break. Um, so a lot of the looking for models become more economic and political rather than visual and aesthetic. And I think that that's quite telling because in, in Ireland, unlike the case you were presenting, there's no coherency in the visual culture. There's no consensus as to what Celticism is. It's, it's mad and... Um, Thomas Bodkin, who was writing about Harry Clark, who admires the Celtic soul of Clark, also talks about the poison taste of Celtic design in contemporary, you know, in contemporary kind of material sort of culture. So it's very conflicted. So the models, I think, become very sharp in politics, but within culture, it becomes very disentangled um, quickly. Thank you. That was a, that was a great question. Sorry, it was. I think about any other questions? I have a perhaps silly question a little bit earlier uh, in a day where I uh, talked about folklore, Tolkien, and I, um, I actually kind of just realized that uh, a lot of the Elvish, very contemporary kind of <laughs> th th uh, aesthetic is seems to be derived on that. What's the historical link there? Um, or is with, there one? With fantasy, I mean, that type of genre, how does it relate back? I suppose there's revivals in Europe of mythology and, and, and legends, you know, forms a basis in Europe. It's definitely, it definitely generates, it creates an appetite, I think, for people, you know, who are interested in other worlds, other ways of living, you know, spirits. In Ireland, I think it was quite important, you know, the Irish mythology, and it is visualized quite distinctly. I think it's Scotland as well, you do find it. Um, and in Ireland, I think a lot of art historians and design historians just don't want to, to research it, you know, spirits and goblins. And, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I didn't get time to, to look at those things, but yeah, illustration is really important. And one thing that struck me yesterday listening to Paul Stearton was the kind of comparability between Hungarian and Irish sort of folk revivalism. And I wonder, is it something to do with the model, educational models and the circulation, the, you know, the ability to see things in print that would be circulating at the time? Because, you know, if, if a magazine like the studio is, is, is publishing in English, you know, a volume of prints of peasant designs in Poland or Hungary, Irish makers ha have access to that. So there's definitely something that becomes 
quite worryingly like an homogenized vernacular in Europe <laughs> where they're all quite similar. Um, but thank you, that's a really great question. Thank you, any other questions? Then please join me in thanking our speakers. <coughs>